this meeting of the Belton Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Four of the board members is present. This meeting has been duly called and notice of the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas <coughs> Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Please rise and join us for the pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. All right, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, we will get started with a board workshop uh, beginning with the 2017 bond projects update from Jared and the crew. Kurt. Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Crew of two tonight. <laughs> More than one is a crew. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you again for having us here to give an update. Uh, it's been an exciting month here since last time. We're starting to see uh, buildings come out of the ground, significant progress on the high school, and as well the two projects getting close to finish up. Uh, Kurt's been handling the construction administration on Charter Oak and Lake Belton and keeping tabs on the other two projects. So he's the man with all the details, so I'm going to let him go over it tonight, and we'll be here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. So the last time we were here, structural steel was beginning to come up out of the ground and beginning to frame the building. In the last month, basically 95% of the steel has been erected. And if you go out there now, you'll see uh, the first classroom wing already has decking installed and the exterior walls have been going up. Um, we've already reviewed the beginning of the mock-up walls out there. And so pretty soon you're gonna see some finishes coming up on the walls, the waterproofing and everything else as they follow around the steel. At the Fine Arts Center, uh, last time, we, roofing was still under progress, and as of now, the roofing has been completed. The auditorium seatings have been installed, and if you look outside, previously, when this photo was taken, they're just beginning to frame up the flat work. Most of that's been poured, the railing's installed, and they're wrapping that project up in the next couple weeks. At Lakewood Elementary, previously, we saw some of the finishes on the exterior of the building going up. In the last couple of weeks, the entire exterior facade has been completed, along with interior finishes going on, ceilings and grids going in. And currently, they're working on some of the flat work on the outside and some of the work with the bus loop. And that one should be completed also in the next couple of weeks. And then the big one, the high school, it has drastically changed since the last time we came here. They began clearing the site, and we got to see all the dirt out there. Well, as you can see on this, you can actually see the building pad has been constructed. You can see the area where the Baseball fields are, and I think this pointer's working. So we got the baseball fields back here, your football fields, here's your building pad for the building, parking lots, and they're currently drilling the piers for the building. Uh, they expect that to go on for about a couple months um, with the amount of piers going out there. And uh, it's honestly been going really quickly and really smoothly, and I'm surprised at how easy that project's been going so far, which is a good sign. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Those are pretty, basically a quick overview of all the projects. Are there any questions? Do you have any questions? These are amazing pictures. Yeah. How, how yes. deep are the piers going to be? I know they're probably different levels. What's the deepest y'all going to go? I think they're around 40 feet, mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in there. Not, it, uh, the soil's not too deep. I think it's uh, five feet down to limestone, and they have to have a certain embedment based on the diameter. Uh, so if you look, actually, the bottom right photo is probably where some of the deepest piers will be because that's the slit and change level. So that would be right coming into the injury and looking down at entry and looking down and out on the cafeteria space. So just that grade level change will create some of that, but uh, pretty impressive. And this site has changed dramatically even over the last couple of weeks since we sent the photos in. The amount of equipment that's out there is gone from just seeing a few trucks to seeing you know, 30 different people out there and all these trucks and drilling rigs. I think they have four drilling rigs going on concurrently. So, so coming up in, in the next couple months, we'll be looking for substantial completion on Lakewood and Wall Street, just in time for school to getting started. And then we have uh, probably another nine months on the elementary school and uh, one year and eight, nine months on the high school. <laughs> 
so a little ways out on those. So. It's going by fast. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It's going by fast. These are great pictures, like Dr. King Cannon said. The one with the water tower in the foreground and the teeny tiny elementary school in the background puts it all in perfection. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Anyone else have questions? Anything else? That's it. All right. Thank you all very much. Yes, Kurt, thank you. For <coughs> Mr. Templeton, next is attendance boundaries process. Good, Good to be back. Thank you. Good to be here. Good evening, board president, members of the board, Dr. King Cannon. Tonight, I will do just a overview of the attendance zone process and uh, just kind of set the stage for what's going to be a very busy fall and getting into the early part of the um, uh, January 2019 as we begin to work on the attendance zone process. So why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because the district is experiencing very high enrollment growth, which is causing campuses to be overcrowded. And we continue to see this uh, growth in the near future. So we know that the growth is the driver for why we're doing it, this. You also know that uh, you know, we passed a bond election in the past. That bond election called for the addition of Charter Oak Elementary School, which will open in the fall of 2019. It also calls for the Belton High School ninth grade crank campus to be converted to the district's fourth middle school. And then ultimately we'll have Lake Belton High School, which will be the district's second high school. So this is a significant attendance on project. Um, we've been in discussion with the administration for several months on this and determined it uh, would be a good solution to just go ahead and do all of these projects at the same time because they kind of tie together. As you go to your fourth middle school, it provides that opportunity to look at how the two middle schools would feed into each of the high schools. So there's some connection between the opening of the middle school, the opening of the high school, and then ultimately the opening of the elementary school. What's the process that we're going to use? Well, we're going to use a committee process. As you've been in discussion for several months on this process, a committee will be used this committee process will take place beginning in the fall, and the results of that work will be to produce recommendations for you to ultimately approve. So we will work over a several month period over the fall. Uh, our team, myself specifically, will be involved. It will also involve the administration as well as a vast number of community members and staff members to give you a very broad perspective in the creation of these new attendant zones. Here's just a big overview picture of the district. One of the challenges that we are going to have with this, the growth is not concentrated in one particular area of the district. So this map just illustrates those green neighborhoods are your subdivisions that are active and that are building homes. I roughly just did a calculation of the housing that's being built within Belton ISD that's in the Temple area versus the amount of housing that's being built in the South or the Belton area and it's pretty comparable. It's almost an even split between the amount of housing that's going on in the north versus the amount of housing that's going on in the south. I think there's a difference of about 30 to 40 homes more being built annually in the north than there is in the south. But um, as you can see, you know, it's going to be something that the district has faced with for many, many years. Your growth is not something that's going to be over with in a five-year period. You're going to be dealing with growth for a number of years just because of the vacant land that you have, the success of the school district, your proximity to this, this region of activity, Temple, Colleen, Belton. This is kind of its own little metroplex area, and the Belton is right in the heart of this area of growth. Here's just a quick review of the enrollment projections. This past October, that gold bar represented the enrollment for October. We had 11,530 students, which we grew this past October about 411 kids, 3.7% growth. During the last five years, we've grown approximately 1,500 students. In the next five years, we're forecasting growth of 2,257. In the next 10 years, you're going to grow by 3,974. So you are going to have the need for continued expansion of buildings, new facilities coming online over the, um, the long term. That's not a short term problem. Here's a look at the elementary campuses. 
As you recall from the map, the district is growing all over. So you'll notice that Chisholm Trail, it's gonna be over 800 students next fall. Joe Pirtle Elementary is gonna be at 782. Leon Heights, 284. And then in five years, in the 2022 school year, we will have five elementary campuses that will be beyond their capacity. So the opening of Charter Oak Elementary School can't come fast enough. You know, it's truly, I know that in two years when we are in 2019, when we open, that's literally as fast as we could do it, but you can see it's going to be very needed. Our challenge is gonna be how do we solve these, um, these overcrowded schools, all of the ones that we're going to have with the opening of just one school. So it's gonna cause us to have to be very creative to look at our options and that's what the committee will do. We will, with my software and our, um, our tools, we will look at all the options that are available to the committee. Which neighborhoods do we need to consider? How are we going to build a, a plan that will last uh, you know, five years. Ideally, we want to draw a plan that's going to last five years. Now, why do I try to get a plan to last five years? We do 10 to 12 of these every year. And where I catch the most heartache from the public mm -hmm. is when we draw a boundary plan and then two years later or three years later, we have to redo it and draw it again. So we're trying to get a plan that will last five years so that we don't have to disrupt the, the, the school kids and have to move them around. So we're trying to make a plan that'll, that'll be one of the, the parameters that I would suggest to you is that we adopt a strategy of as best as possible, we wanna create a plan that'll last at least five years. Um, at the secondary level, uh, our last uh, plan coincided with our 2012 bond program, so we were drawing and implementing attendance new attendance boundaries in the 13 and the 14 school year. And as a matter of fact, I think we phased those in in two phases during that time period. So it's been about five years since we've done this. That's good. So then you're able to get those kids through the cycle of Correct. before you have to change it again. And that doesn't mean that sometimes siblings are impacted, but the goal is to keep those from first graders that move, they don't get moved again until they're, they're beyond into the next level of, of campuses. At the secondary level, you'll notice that um, um, North Belton High Sc Middle School will be over 1,000 students next fall. Lake Belton Middle School will be right at capacity, almost 900, and by 2020, that's the year that the changes will go into effect. So the ninth grade campus will be converted to the fourth middle school and be ready to go in 2020. So when we do that, we'll have capacity of approximately four to over 4,000 students. So we'll be able to redistribute those students and get all four of those campuses ideally under, you know, if, at an efficient use. And it, Ideally, it would be nice if we could get two middle schools per high school. So that will be one of the, the goals that I would suggest that you consider is pure feeder patterns. So that is, a, that is a parameter that we see most is the middle schools to high schools, getting those lined up because of um, just programming, because of uh, extracurricular, those things they like for those to kind of line up. Also, it's good for those middle school kids to stay together as they get up into high school. You'll notice at the high school by 2020, we'll have almost 3,300 kids at um, the high school. So the timing is is nice to where we could have um, and, and take that's, care of the overcrowding at that's actually, High School. That's actually higher, Bob. We have uh, 3,300 now at the high school level. So we're looking at about 3,800 by 2020. When you put the ninth grade in there, yes. Correct. So right. when we put ninth grade with that number, it does, it gets it up to almost 3,900 high school students. Now, I'll just briefly review the process. Committee members are made up of parents, community members, and staff. The committee will, will be facilitated by the superintendent, by the deputy superintendent, and by myself. The committee will be assisted by the administration and consultants, our team. The committee will work for several weeks to review different options and study the impacts of the potential zone changes 
I would suggest that we start at the high school level first and work down from that. I think it would be nice to handle the big picture and you can deal with the big picture at the high school level. Um, and that would be a good way to start that and then work that down from there to the middle school and then ultimately finish with the elementary attendance zones. Um, the committee will ultimately be responsible for making recommendations, but ultimately it is the board's action that will set the attendance zones in place. What is needed to assist the committee from the board? Well, parameters for the new attendance zones. The committee will need to kind of know your uh, priorities for what's important to the board. I think this is a vital, um, this is the most, one of the most important pieces of what, how you can help the committee. I've got some examples of different uh, districts and what has been their parameters. Uh, we literally do about a dozen of these a year. We've done them in Oklahoma and other states. Uh, we've done them all over the state of Texas. One of those is, what's the target enrollments for the new school? What do we want to open the new school with? Do we want the elementary to open with you know, a minimum of a certain number of students? Do we need the high school to open with a certain number of students? There are financial reasons for that. There's equitably, equitable reasons for that, but setting a target can be helpful. How long do we need the attendance zones to last? A minimum of five years at the elementary level. And then you can see from those high school and middle school numbers, we're gonna be able to make those last longer. I don't know that that's going to be as much of a priority for the middle schools and high schools because we're the bigger geographies and we have bigger buildings. So they're gonna be able to last longer naturally. It's those elementary zones where we're going to have the challenge with uh, trying to get those zones to last a certain number of years. Our feeder patterns, are that, is that a priority? Neighborhood schools, uh, transportation impact, efficient campus utilization. I had one project where the district actually had us calculate the cost per student by campus. And they literally wanted to use that as a parameter. And that was a, um, a parameter that then uh, handicapped the district. And so you do have to be careful that your parameters don't put you in a difficult position. Um, another example might be um, proximity. If you use proximity as a parameter, proximity and efficient use of the buildings can come into conflict with each other. If I equally utilize all the buildings to the same efficiency, efficiency level, I may not be able to have the closest proximity of a neighborhood to a campus as their number one campus. Does that make sense? That's just simply because of distance and spaces where there's not any schools in an area. Um, use of natural boundary lines, such as major roads, freeways, railroad tracks, lakes, creeks, um, Natural boundary lines can be very helpful in just creating a uh, attendance zone that's easy to identify. Uh, the board's role is to provide uh, guidance on the attendance zone guidelines. These are, the committee meetings are public board meetings. So they will be posted as board meetings. Uh, this is to allow the board members to attend the meetings for the primary purpose of listening and observing so that you can watch the actions of the committee. Therefore, when a recommendation is made, you'll have more background information and kind of understand how the committee got to its recommendation. It's not meant for you to um, necessarily be overly involved in the process, but it's purely meant to allow you to be able to witness and watch and get as much information as you can but ultimately you will be making a recommendation, you will be approving it. Here's some examples from other school districts. This is Edmond, Oklahoma. They were doing a middle school um, boundary project and they wanted their attendance areas to last five years. They wanted to take into consideration walking paths. They wanted to allow for smaller school populations in the school districts with the highest anticipated growth. So they were trying to anticipate the growth that we provided, the growth factors, so they would have smaller campuses where there was the highest amount of growth. Uh, neighborhoods should be assigned to the same school when possible. That's feeder patterns discussion. 
and the district should honor existing transfers. So they made the decision in Edmond that if you were transferring to a campus, you were allowed to continue to transfer. And so what is the impact of that? Well, when you allow transfers to continue where they're at, sometimes it will just delay the uh, efficiency of the new building. So as an example, and I don't know if this would happen, but if you allowed all of the ninth graders to grandfather when you open that new high school, or not grandfather, if you just allowed them to transfer, then your impact at your new high school might be a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. In fast growth areas, sometimes that can be a problem, but um, and, and it's, it's typically a matter of allowing some flexibility for the uh, community. One of the things we did in the last time we did some rezoning was to um, implement what we called an early transfer timeline process. And so we gave our um, parents and students an opportunity to apply for a transfer and with a deadline of doing that. So let's say we implemented new boundaries and approved those in January then we would give them a March um, or early April deadline. And that gave us the opportunity that, to then evaluate how many people wanted to transfer so that we could see if we could make that work with staffing and the capacities of the buildings. And that was pretty effective for us and we were able to manage it um, because we had the information early. That, that is one of the benefits of adopting your middle school and high school boundaries early. So we're adopting that we will be adopting these boundaries in January of 19, whereas the schools will not open in the, until the fall of 20. So there would be sufficient time to communicate. We did the same process with Bernie ISD and their you know, opening two elementaries and a middle school and we did those boundaries two years in advance and they are now communicating the, pro the transfer process and allowing parents to, to sign up for transfers actually for the next year. So. Our, um, we were intentional with our strategy to have those attendance boundaries drawn early because we wanted our students, especially our high school students, to know when they entered the ninth grade building as a high school student which high school they would go to. So remember, we're moving students um, who will be sophomores um, to the new high school. We'll open with freshmen and sophomores. So we want you to be able to identify with your school, pick your courses, and we want to staff. Um, and we've been we've been having some conversations recently about how we can develop some school culture um, with those students, even while they're ninth graders before they go before they move into their new building. So they might even have their own freshman focus, so that there's some opportunity for them to connect um, and bond as a group of, as a student body. Here's an example of the Eagle Mountain Saginaw School District, the attendant zone consideration, their guidelines, uh, optimized space, neighborhood unity, keeping subdivisions together, natural boundary lines, growth, contiguous boundary, boundaries. They, they considered the social economic factors, transportation cost, family impact. The family impact was trying to get those boundaries to last uh, a certain number of years so that they wouldn't have to change schools while they were still in uh, elementary school, feeder pattern alignment, and balancing for funding and program equity. So those are just the list of the ones that were being used with the Eagle Mountain Saginaw School District. Frequently asked questions from the public. The, the more questions that you can proactively answer ahead of time, and get that communicated will be very helpful. Why are we doing this? Because of the growth. When will the new principals be picked? You'd be surprised at the amount of concern that the public will have around who the principals are gonna be, who the staff is gonna be. There's this mindset in many areas where when there's a new campus, it's gonna be filled with new teachers, and that is not the case. Many times it is a mix of veteran teachers, new teachers, many times the staff you know, come to the new school, you know, kind of voluntarily. There's not this, you know, uh, massive amount of brand new teachers that'll be at a school, but you'd be surprised. There will be folks that will think that's how it's going to be. Uh, how will the teachers be assigned to the schools? Grandfather transfers, transfers as a whole is going to be a pretty big concern. Elementary all the way through. Will transportation be provided if I'm a grandfather? 
UIL questions about uh, classifications and eligibility, uh, transfer questions overall, what about siblings of transfers, will I be able to ride the bus, questions about the bus routes um, will be um, a, a significant uh, question or concern. What will the school times be? Will there be any special programs at the new schools? Will there be crossing guards? To, and all these we think of as common, you know, common things, but this will be questions that will come up from the public. How will the drop-off and the pickup be handled at the new school? When will the PTA or the PTO be formed? Um, just a variety of questions that you can get answered ahead of time and get those posted will be very, very helpful. The timeline. Well, the board provided a charge or guidelines for the committee. That's the first step. The committee begins works on the plan in August. So in August, the committees will start. The committee will work through November to develop plans for elementary, middle, and high school attendance zone recommendations. The public forums will take place in December. The review of the input from the public forum. So we're gonna listen, we're gonna take input, we're gonna process that and see if that causes any reaction that needs to be made to the plans. And then those plans will be presented to the board and it is thought that the board will take action in January. That, in my mind, is a good amount of time. There's more than a month, almost two months, to work on the plan, and then there is the time to communicate the plan to the public, and then there's the time for you to um, process the plan, and if you have any additional questions that could go back to the committee, we'd have time to work on that. I've developed just my top five so this is my uh, David Letterman's top five. Uh, this is not meant for you to be the start of yours, but it's just meant for you to be a, things to consider. These are the things that I see most often in attendance zone guidelines. Attendance zones should be designed to last at least five years. Make the best effort to keep subdivisions together. The efficient use of the buildings to reduce overcrowding in buildings when possible. Transportation routes should be as efficient as possible, giving consideration to minimize ride times. That's not just ride times on a bus, that's also ride times and commute times for parents in their uh, traveling as well. Uh, we'll attempt to use natural boundary lines when possible. Guidelines vary from district to district depending upon the growth rates, the available space, future campus additions, or bonding capacities. There you have it. That's my um, overview of the process and uh, be ready to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. One, just talking about the elementary, if we grew as a district about 411 students this year, what was the breakdown of the elementary? Do you know how many there were that, that had that 411? Mm -hmm. um, head, about 190 this past year. So 190 and we're basically building elementaries that hold about 800 now, is that what it is? I believe so. 792 to 800, yes. Just trying to see when that next one will be. You know, I, I think you, that's going to be a great um, strategic thing to try to identify. Ideally, if we got really good and we maximized as best as we could, we could get to about 77,200, um, which... I think that's difficult to do. We, uh, when we looked at, Jared had a really nice chart when we went through the bond planning um, process to decide on our um, 2025 plan. And I believe that showed a new elementary school about every five years. So that puts us at about 23 or 24. And so we had, we had been saying all along as the time, about the time we're wrapping up this bond program, will be planning for the next mm -hmm. elementary school or two um, moving forward. So um, we can pull, we can resurrect that chart and um, share that with you. So you can see it, it, it's done really nicely just to kind of show that pattern and when new elementary schools, new middle schools might come online. Anybody remember that? Yes. I remember Jared sharing that with us. So yeah, I just didn't remember that particular yeah 23 or 24, you, you can get to the the maximum capacity. The problem is you, um, you don't you don't always fill up to capacity evenly across the district. So there has to be some 
additional space built into into that to, I, to make it work i just noticed this past week in preparation for this meeting the um the early child belt and early childhood <clears throat> capacity is calculated within this 7200 and it really shouldn't be mm -hmm. because there is in, by this gauge we've got about 200 available seats and it's listed in the elementary campuses but it's really not accessible to those k-5 kids so what that means is this number is really closer to about 6,900, 7,000. And to Dr. Kincannon's point, we are not going to get 100% utilization in every elementary campus. So I think the reality is when we get out to about 2022, 2023, 24, maybe, I think we're, it's going to be somewhere between 2022 to 2024 is when we're going to need that campus. Now with the school opening in 2019, if we can make these boundaries last until 2024, we will have accomplished that five year target. Mm -hmm. And you know, we may have to use some strategies of shifting programs or uh, moving certain aspects, uh, programs to get us through that point. But I think we consider all of our options. Yeah, we have to consider all that, but programs will be an issue as well um, because we'll be adding some, um, duplicating some services that we need now um, because our programs have grown as the district has grown. So we, we need some additional sections of some special ed classrooms that um, are going to require some space in the new facilities too. So that'll be another challenge that we have. I have a quick question. So in all of your experiences with other districts, do you think that our particular <coughs> geographic layout that's spread out over so many, many miles, is that unique to us or have you worked with other districts that have the same problem? Oh, I have, we have several that have it, the same problem or same opportunity, same challenges. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we work with Comal ISD. Comal ISD is 600 square miles and it really feels like four school districts within one. You've got the New Braunfels proper area, which is where Canyon High School <clears throat> is. You've got Smithson Valley, which is way over on 281, which is actually goes all the way down into almost San Antonio. And then you've got Garden Ridge, and then you've got the Canyon Lake area, which has its <clears throat> own uh, identity. And so, um, no, you're not unique in that, you know, the growth is spread out. You've got multiple, sit two, two main cities. But uh, I'd say this is something that we see with a lot of school districts. Okay. Any other questions? No? So we want to um, get you to set some parameters, and we can talk about those again next month. Um, and that will be timely in um, preparation for that first attendance boundary meeting, which will follow the week after your August board meeting. So if there's any, um, if you have any input you'd like to give us, we'd like to have that. And we can talk about it, come up with a draft. This is Bob's draft. I think you'll have some of the items on this draft, but if you have some additional items you want to talk about, we can do that. And you can have more than five. That was just my uh, <laughs> uh, start at this. I've got one more. And yeah. this, you know, obviously this is happening all over, you know, but to me the jump from one to two is always the biggest one. And speaking to people, I was at a conference talking to somebody one time from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, when Bentonville, I guess, they, they went from one to two. And so they were really talking about a lot of the similar things that we did about mm -hmm. the, the naming and the mascots and all that stuff. But that freshman class that's going to be together at Belton High School, then they'll be the sophomores that follow them here at Belton. I would think that the UIL ramifications and the, that extracurricular stuff, especially with the sports, is really going to be, it would be nice to see what other districts from the jump from one to two, how they've handled that, how hard the, the mm -hmm. transfer policy is, and because there's so many things that get involved there. Mm -hmm. People, you know, are already asking tons of questions mm -hmm. about that specific thing. So yes. it'd be nice to see a comparison and maybe we look at other districts and how that's worked with those freshmen going to that sophomore year, how how those things work. Mm -hmm. I think you, um, you get to design it the way you want it. 
And, and I think there may be some natural, when we look at maps, Bob and I were talking last week about how some of those um, natural boundary lines may make that, that picture a little clearer for you mm -hmm. when we do that. Um, then there's some other things we'll wanna um, consider as well, such as new instructional facilities allotment and uh, into that process and the money that we might qualify for from the legislature to help us staff the new school. So there are multiple factors, but I think having some maps and talking about UIL classification along the way might be easier than deciding up front we want this and we want that because you you could say that, but until you get in there and look at the the maps, it it may not align to what you want. If that makes sense, does that make sense, Bob? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, this is our opportunity board workshop to give uh, our thoughts on what uh, we think the committee's priorities should be. Um, like Dr. Ken Cannon said, I think, I think we have here some natural geographic boundary lines that could be interesting. And Bob, you were saying that the growth looks like in the north and the south. Right now, it's pretty well split in terms of student population anyway mm -hmm. um and that the growth is headed that way so there's some of that um neighborhood schools has typically been a, a priority for us when you're looking at elementary elementary schools um so any thoughts on that um you guys throw them out there the feeder patterns you'd mentioned earlier that that that's a suggestion from you that we that we take that approach and um, I agree with that. And I think that sort of feeds into our natural geographic boundaries as well. Um, and having the two high schools with different mascots and, and what happens in that regard, um, you know, that might be uh, an interesting way to go. Yeah. So is the breakdown, when you talk about natural geographic lines, we're talking about the river, right, basically? Yeah. Talking about major roads. Yeah, I mean, we've got 317 running straight down the middle. Equal as far as students go. It is. It is pretty equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It know, is now. And, yeah. One of the things that I've is, I just think is so important, and it's always been this, this dif difficult tension, is we want to make sure every school is diverse and, and every student has the same opportunities to learn in every single school exactly the same, that it's equal across the board and then there's this tension of you know we don't want to burden families with having to travel far far away to make sure everything is equal and everybody is getting the right the same education so that's the tension we want to work we want to make sure that we walk that line and, and be as fair and and good to our kids as we possibly can and to our families without leaning too much one way or the other because you know it's it is a tension it's just hard that's where the parameters are very important. If you use uh, uh, balancing or diversity as a hard number that you're going to achieve a certain diversity, it comes into conflict with proximity. Mm -hmm. So therefore then to make the numbers equal across all the campuses will cause the proximity to now be, so then it's which of those is more important. Is it more important for proximity? That's why I like it when we use, we say um, diversity will be a consideration. What does that mean? Well, we're going to report the numbers and look at the numbers. And if we see one that's, you know, 10% and 90%, then we know that there's some work that needs to be done. But we may get to a point where it's going to be 40 and 60 or 45, 55. Therefore, that, you know, then the, the distance is in line, and so then, boom, we like it. It's, it's where it needs to be. You know, the other the thing that I wanted to just kind of point out is that this is not the first time that we've done this, right? I mean, some of us on the board may have not experienced this, but this has been done before. It's been done in a manner that the community and others have been involved in. We've listened to the community. Those listening sessions or those uh, opportunities for the community to come in and provide what they think uh, is 
important. It's really important because we want to listen to our community. And the administration here, uh, they've got some good background and, and those, uh, those data points to kind of help us uh, guide our decision making. So uh, I am just really excited about this. I know that it's a contentious thing sometimes. <laughs> however, however, we just need to bite the bullet and get it over with. Yep. It'll be fine. Bob, you had mentioned one thing in there that, because this will be a little bit different. I wasn't on the board last time we did this, but this is the first time we're opening a second high school. Um, I guess the only time we'd open a second high school, the next one would be the third. <laughs> um, but you'd mentioned that when other districts have done this, if they work from the, the bigger down to the smaller, we tend to have a little bit better parameters to work within. If you start with the high school in mind, and then to the junior highs and down, because we're going to have four junior highs. I think everybody kind of agrees we're going to try to go two and two and just work from that point. Yes. Um, One other strategy would be to do the junior highs or the middle schools first, and then that becomes your high schools. And so I've seen districts that have done that. They've said feeder patterns are a must. Okay. And then when you say feeder patterns are a must, then it becomes, okay, we got to do the – We've got to do the junior high or middle schools because that's the number one priority. So then, boom, that will create automatically your high schools. Okay. I think we really need to be careful with optimized space. I mean, we're already maxing out multiple budgets. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're asking the community for tons of money and bonds and things, and we really need to be careful as fast as we are growing that we make sure that we're doing it as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it, just it doesn't make sense to do all of this and be so contentious about spending this money and where we're going and what's going on. We really need to be careful about we're, we're utilizing every space we can possibly use because this isn't stopping anytime soon that, uh, that I'm aware of. I mean, the, this gets, keeps getting pushed out further and further over the several years I've been on the board. So uh, the fast growth isn't stopping. So let's do the, the best we can do to prepare for that. And I think that the point that you made that the growth in Belton proper and, and Temple in our district is pretty even. I think some of those issues that you talked about, you know, trying to group certain things together, I think those things will balance out pretty quickly with as fast as the growth mm -hmm. is. Uh, where maybe it doesn't need to be such a point of contention, you know, mm -hmm. accountability, state accountability tests and things like that. I, that stuff's going to even out pretty quickly, I would think, over that, that five year kind of goal that we've got set. Mm -hmm. At the high schools, at the, the, the bulk of the high school boundary is going to be pretty obvious. It'll be the fringe. It'll be how we wiggle the line. So it's going to be the, 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 the in-between area. But a majority of the north and a majority of the south, that's kind of, of because of the locations of the two sites, there's going to be a, a majority of those boundaries are going to be pretty easy to get to. Same for the middle schools. Where there's going to be a little more challenge is going to be the opening of the Charter Oak Elementary and how do we solve the problems at uh, Chisholm with it being so far away? How do we then deal with the growth, you know, because the, the Charter Oak will easily help Hurdle. It'll easily help Tarver. There's, their proximity will allow it to easily assist those campuses around that location. It'll be the uh, elementary zones in the south. That, But it wouldn't have mattered if you'd have put the school in the south, yeah. you'd have had the same problem the other way. Mm -hmm. So it's really a function of not, you know, which of the sites was, was better. It's the fact that you, you know, have won to try to solve problem or opportunities around the district. Mm -hmm. And I think what Ty was saying is that the district's demographics are changing. Um, in the South particularly, and it may not be as difficult, and I think it will be in some cases, but may perhaps not as much as it had been in the past, the, South Delta. Mm -hmm. the yeah. disparities, yeah. and we'll still have yeah. some, um, but, but our district is changing, mm -hmm. and, and that's a very valid point. Well, I do, I, I will say to the board members, especially newer ones, that that tends to be what I remember last time a big issue is the diversity and I like the way the way Bob put it that it needs to be a consideration it absolutely does but we also need to understand the impacts that has like Janet said on parents who 
most of the time are opposed to the transportation issue, whether it's them personally transporting or having their child on a bus for a longer period of time and the implications on transportation costs and other things. So in these meetings, what you'll hear um, is there, there are a lot of committee members historically, and especially in the public forums um, where we're meeting with parents, most, mostly at the different schools, if we do that again. Um, but it's a very personal process for um, the community and everyone's personal issue is different and their issue has implications on others. So um, it's important that, that we understand the decision has to be made for the school district as a whole, the best thing, and, and that's, it's tricky. It's a process, but we've been through it before and Dr. King cannon has been through it before. A few times. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll all work out, yeah. but yeah. It's, it's a very interesting and challenging process. Mm -hmm. So what's our time frame? Do we are we we're not are we expecting to make a decision on this stuff today? Are we just talking about no. this today? What's our plan? So no. I think you gave some pretty good feedback that we can um, edit uh, Bob's draft as a starting point, and um, then you guys can come back next month and um, finalize that, and then we can share that with the committee when we meet with them at the end of August. Yeah. And if you have thoughts between then and way. now, yeah, yeah, get them to Dr. King Ken and. Um, We'll start compiling all of that. And they're, they're parameters. They're the, the ideal, right? The guideline. As, I usually like to put in there as best as possible. As best as possible. And so you're, you want to achieve when those, possible. but you may not achieve all of them. But yes. we, we, you know, we want to start with what you want <laughs> first. Yeah, and sometimes it's planting seed with the committee. You know, the, some of those people may come in here without much in mind. And, um, the more we can educate them on the priorities of the board and the school district and the community, mm -hmm. um, the better. In New Braunfels is a classic example, or Comal ISD, that uh, Lake Canyons High School. If you know where that high school is, it's way out there on the other side of the lake. For us to try to get to 90% utilization of that building causes us to have to draw that boundary in such a way that the parents will revolt because they'll be driving 30 miles to get to that high school. So we cannot get to 90% utilization in that building because of the location. Now, you don't have that here. That's just an example of where sometimes the parameters, if you're not careful, could paint you into a corner. Mm -hmm. So you do want to be you know, as thoughtful and give them some guidelines like feeder patterns for the secondary, neighborhood schools. Those are good concepts that we can easily work with. And, and something else too, you know, looking from the athletic standpoint, uh, numbers are important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can set yourself up for failure. You put the schools in the classifications without sufficient numbers to be able to compete. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to have a bunch of over, you know, seasons across the board. Looking at the data from our report this time, look at the average of our finishes in varsity sports. It was incredible this year. It was something to be proud of. And mm -hmm. we, we don't want that to fall. So we want to try to keep those numbers up, you know, to where we have numbers to field the competitive teams as well. So that's something to think about as a target to look at. Yeah, that um, that athletics is particularly hard with the opening of a high school. And we heard that over and over when we had talked to districts who had moved from one high school to two. And um, so that certainly should be a consideration. Um, but I will remind you that as rapidly as we're growing, we will end up in the same classification in a pretty short mm -hmm. amount of time. Eight years probably? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at the pick, the forecast and that high school number and how how quickly we get to nearly 5,000 high school students, mm -hmm. we, will, we will end up mm -hmm. um, right. close to or in the same classification. Quick question on Chisholm. Don't have to start there though. <laughs> Quick question on Chisholm Trail currently. You know, they're busting at the seams and the new elementary is nowhere near them. <laughs> so what's our plan to help them with their numbers? Yeah, we have some options and we'll, um, we're, we're, we actually have a planning meeting this week to kind of dive into that and start talking about that with the administrative team. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do it through attendance boundaries and there's some other ways we could address it too. So, um, 
we don't we don't know yet until we get that go through you know, the process. You can tell by looking at the attendant zone how big it is. Yeah. That several years ago it was that rural zone that just covered a big area. Yeah. But because of you can see the little green spot. Well, not little. Uh, three forks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, three forks is the real driver for this growth. Three creeks. Three creeks. And you've got a couple of other little ones throughout here, but it's just a huge geographic zone that was the fact that it was the rural attendant zone several years ago. 1,500 lot, and what are the, well, how much are they built out at this point? Oh, that's just early in its development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We um, have some options, one of the options we have is to move the bilingual program um, if we so choose to do that, and the, we'll talk through all of those options as we move forward. So. We don't have all the answers tonight, but um, that's a challenge for us, certainly. All right. Any other questions? Good points. Thank Mr. you. We're, we're ready to assist. We've done this with many districts, and so mm -hmm. our whole team is, you know, ready to go with this project. We're really uh, excited. Yep. Very and helpful. Really excited about having Bob on board this time. Bob wasn't with us when we did attendance boundaries last time, and. Um, we pretty much did it in-house. Bob has some fabulous um, tools that are, I think, going to make it easier for us this time, and we um, thank him for his help, get, helping yeah. us get there. You're welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a good top five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Buckle up, everyone, because it's a quick, chaotic process. Um, it all works out. Um, okay, next board will go into closed session to discuss personnel in accordance with Texas Government Code Section 551.074. It is 6.06 .06 and the board will now reconvene in open session. And we'll start this section of the meeting with recognition. Yeah, and we have a big one to start off with. Hey. Yeah. For the second year in a row, Belton High School students are the Skills USA Teamworks National Champions. Again, I'm going to repeat that National Champions. The team of construction trade students, Bailey Eichenlorf, William Blazer, Antonio Hernandez, Laihu Li Penny, took first place in the Teamworks event at the 2018 Skills USA National Student Leadership Conference held last month in Louisville, like Kentucky. This year's build was an 8 by 8 structure with vinyl siding, detailed decorative brickwork, full kitchen with stove, dishwasher, sink with disposal, micro microwave vent hood, and a hip roof. The only schools that completely finished the project were Belton, representing Texas, Georgia, and South Carolina. The Skills USA Teamwork sponsor needs no introduction, Mr. Craig Sullivan. This title represents Sullivan's second national championship. His teams placed first at nationals in 2017, sixth in 2016, fourth in 2015, and seventh in 2014. Congratulations. Wow. Way to go, you guys, again. Um, and Craig, great job as usual. Um, it's just amazing to me uh, what you've been able to do, what you've uh, been able to accomplish uh, year over year. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Maybe and the first time crew I've ever had that's actually working in their trade right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a very important piece of this, too. Um, job ready day one. Yep. Ready day. Job ready day one. Sounds like they are, um, and that's impressive. One of only three schools in the country that was even able to finish, um, but to, to do what you guys have done and what you've done in the last two years, amazing. Hour and a half early. Wow. <laughs> it's even more impressive. All right. Sounds like it was a no-brainer then. Possibly. And the video possibly. was really cool too. Possibly. Hey, well, right. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for coming, too. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And we have another national gold medal winner. Unfortunately, she's not able to be here with us tonight, but I do want to go ahead and recognize her because we'll get her her um, certificate. Belton High School student Ashley Ficker won a gold medal at the Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, also known as FCCLA, National Leadership Conference in Atlanta, Georgia this month. Um, Ashley took first place in the interior design category and was awarded a $3,000 scholarship to the Art Institute, along with a full scholarship to the summer seminar at the prestigious Savannah College of Art and Design. Her sponsor is Melissa Beecham.
Uh, I'm sorry, Ashley couldn't be here tonight. Uh, this is a really big deal as well. Um, so congratulations to her. And, and uh, thank you, Melissa, for everything that you do. Keeping with the trend of national recognitions, um, US News and World Report Best High School Silver Medal uh, Campus, Belton New Tech High School at Wasco. Come on up, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. <laughs> each, year, each year, US News and World Report recognizes top high schools with gold, silver, and bronze medals. This year, Belton New Tech received a silver medal for being a high-performing school based on college readiness as measured by performance on state exams. This is a selective group. Less than one-third of schools nationwide are recognized, and less than 11% are awarded silver medals. Last year, um, New Tech was a bronze medal, correct, Mr. Smith? Moved up. They're moving wow. up. Congratulations. Yeah, that's great. A lot of national recognition. Congratulations. Another big part of the community, the Big Red community, Project Apple Tree. Each year, Project Apple Tree supports 1,500 students in Belton ISD. I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with it. Jeanette Kelly, a former school board member and elementary school principal in Belton ISD, started Project Apple Tree 18 years ago with the goal of ensuring that all students, no matter their economic circumstances, have a great first day of school. Now, even though Jeanette has stepped away, Helping Hands Ministry and a strong team of volunteers are continuing this important community effort. Some of those volunteers include Sarah Hector, who's a coordinator, but also Miss June Sanderford, who I understand was part of starting it with Jeanette Kelly. So they're going to say a few words to us. Thank you, Dr. Kincannon and board. We appreciate your support. This is a Helping Hands project, and uh, they do the vetting, and because they know the community, they select or they allow children to register through them. Uh, this will be our 19th year. This last year, the 18th year, we had 1,333 children from uh, K-12 that had a new set of clothing, complete grade appropriate school supplies because of this. So things have changed a bit this year and uh, we're a little slower, but we're still anticipating over a thousand this year as well. Um, if you're not familiar with that, we talk about red and yellow apples and you know how in an industry you just sort of forget, people don't know what you're talking about, but a red apple would have clothing total list of the children's sizes, and the parents give us that information. The yellow one would say the grade, the school that they attend, and uh, give you a clue on that. Um, we have a lot of community support for this project, uh, but one of the biggest supports we have is Belton Independent School District. Starting the week after spring break, uh, there's a kickoff campaign that you guys let us do and all of the campuses, the administration office and transportation department uh, do projects of various kinds and raise money to help us print things, buy the paper goods, get things started, some pre-purchasing and that kind of thing. This year, they raised almost $8,000. And the transportation department, these folks love these kids. They sell sausage wraps. So we need to make sure you all get in on when that day is because they're really quite good and we appreciate that. But the campuses were amazing in some of the projects they came up with. So we, we really appreciate that. Um, Emerson Construction filled in some blanks for us this year. Jeanette Kelly had a nice big house and we invaded her every year and had all of our paperwork period done at her house. Well, for some reason when she retired, she didn't want us showing up every morning at eight o'clock. And so <laughs> Emerson said, well, we have some space, so we've appreciated that. But then for years now, and I saw Dr. O'Rear back here a while ago, uh, the University of Mary Hart and Baylor has found us a nice, clean, air-conditioned, wonderful, welcoming space to do our coordinating. And we start that right after July 4th. And that's where we are now. And we'd like to particularly invite each of you to come see how this works. Kind of an amazing process that Ms. Kelly put in place and we're trying to keep the balls in the air and making it continue. So, and also on August 13th, Distribution Day, we'd love for you to come by and take a look or either come play with us for a few minutes. It takes about 250 folks that day uh, to make that happen and it works smooth as silk and uh, even if it rains and we do, <laughs> for whatever reason in August, it never rains, but it does on Distribution Day. And so <laughs> that, that's not uncommon. Um, you will see around the community a lot of businesses are allowing us to put collection jars. We do that not because we get so much money that way, 
but it puts the project before the community. We asked First Baptist Church to do something for us this year because we were kind of slow in getting folks in, and they allowed us to put on the marquee a statement that we were now registering. And uh, so we have six more registration days, and we expect they'll come rolling in pretty fast uh, in the last piece of this. Um, as we look at what happens here, our whole goal is for every child to start school feeling good about themselves and ready to go. And if they are, that gives them an equal playing field with every other kid. And that's what we're really after. And as I listened to your workshop while ago, I'm an old teacher principal, and I am so glad to be retired. You know, good luck, <laughs> fellas. And we, we really appreciate what you're doing here. That's a great effort. Do you have any questions about our project, our intent? We're ready to provide some apples in the back. June made it very easy. She filled out everything but your name and phone number if you want to take one. So anyway, we'll be back there a few minutes if you're interested. Any questions? Again, thank you so much for your yeah, support thank of you. us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for what you do. Um, it speaks to uh, what a great community we have and how supportive they are of um, of our kids and of our school district. Thank you very much. Elizabeth? Yeah. Next up is our Big Red Community Partner for July. Belton ISD and the University of Mary Hardin Baylor have built a close working relationship that has produced a strong history of providing significant educational opportunities for students to excel. From the unique on-campus dual credit opportunities for Belton ISD students to the UMHB student teaching or student intern positions at our campuses, it is easy to see the partnership in action on an almost daily basis. Additionally, the use of facilities, instructional collaboration, and shared commitment to service on various community organizations like Project Apple Tree aligns Belton ISD and UMHB administrators in many ways that directly benefit our students, the city of Belton, and Bell County. For their continued partnership and support of Belton ISD, UMHB is this month's Big Red Community Partner. Dr. Randy O'Rear, President of UMHB, accepted the award. Thank you. Real quick before we move on, and thank you guys for coming. Um, Mary Harden Baylor is a great partner uh, with Belton ISD and a great asset to our community. Um, we talked about job ready day one. We also prepare kids to be college ready day one um, as they leave Belton ISD. And what a great opportunity for our kids to have such a great local university. Uh, another thing they do, they have a great education program and uh, are a great feeder for uh, teachers for our school district and for other school districts locally. So, uh, Dr. Rear, thank you again for everything that y'all do. Hey, uh, real, real quick, Mike. Uh, just an example of that was last year, I remember turning on the radio and hearing the radio call-in uh, show. Dr. Rear uh, helped out. Uh, yes. Uh, he was the, core, I, I guess... That. Our social media town hall yes. and Dr. O'Rear facilitated that was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Did real yeah. well too. That's committed right that, there. That was Multi -talented. Above, yes. above and beyond the yes. call of duty. Yeah. Thank you. Not only can <laughs> he run he a university. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you. Well, a maybe we're overselling it then. <laughs> well, either way, thank you for being here and thank you for all you do. All right. Next. Uh, public comments. I didn't receive any any notifications. Um, is there anyone wishing to make comments to the board? Seeing no takers, we'll move to the consent agenda. Um, does any board member want any item taken off of the consent agenda? And Janet, you had mentioned the I, I have a question center. about the swim center equipment repair. We can take that. I mean, I don't know if I guess I can't just ask that now. We've got to. We have to pull yeah, we, that. We can pull it off and and uh, get into it next. Um, so let's do that. We'll take the swim center equipment repair out of the consent agenda. 
Anything else that uh, a board member would like removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, um, willing to accept a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Motion by Ms. Jordan, second by Mr. Floor. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously, with the exception of what we will get into next, if that's okay, yep. Dr. King Cannon, before your report, the swim center repair. Yeah, so just basically, I know that we've got some future plans for the swim center. Don't know exactly when or, or how much <laughs> we're gonna get into that, but, but if we're going to have two dehumidifiers totaling fifty thousand dollars i know that's a lot it, it said they they are aging does that mean they are failing have failed and if we replace them is this something that will transfer over into whatever we do next you know, are they going to have a life to them yeah so that's a good question i'll ask um dr muller to come up and i'll start um and he can fill in for me um but they are um they are fail. One has been uh, um, non-operational, and the other one, I believe, failed this summer. Um, they have some some um, oh gosh, some product inside that has the duct work that has broken loose, and so we aren't able to use it because it's pushing particles out into the pool and it's very uncomfortable in the swim center. So while we have swim center repairs on our capital projects list, we don't have a designed facility and we haven't identified that funding yet. So it would, it would be some time before we could address the swim center. And there, and there are some options, Jared, I believe could help me, that do allow us to keep that main core of that facility. So I think that it's possible that those could be used um, and then that's about all I could say. I'll let David take it from and here. Let me and just Robert. sort of simplify it. So all we are replacing is the ductwork. It is the supply and return ductwork that is exterior to the building, which is where the insulation is inside that ductwork. The insulation should have been put on the outside, not on the inside. So it's deteriorated over years. It's now falling into the water. So we're not replacing the unit or the equipment. It's only the ductwork. And they're, we, they're we, very we did get a price to replace the equipment. It was close to half a million dollars. So this will buy us some time. Yeah. I don't think you can wait on it. It's pretty uncomfortable in that facility, and um, we don't have a timeline developed yet for any changes to the swim center. So I think we need to move forward with That's my recommendation. Well, Jennery has to get a new computer every year, probably due to this. Mm -hmm. Not getting the humidity out of there. It's mm -hmm. tough on their copier computers. Yeah. It's tough on it's everything. Something hmm. that has to be done until we can formulate a plan. Yep. Thank you for that information. Sure. Yep. Anything else, Janet? You good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions about the swim center equipment repair? Okay. Then I believe, and Angela, you can steer me back on course if I if I veer off. But I believe we need to um, approve that separate as an expenditure of proposed fifty two thousand one hundred and sixty nine dollars so i would accept a, a motion of approval motion. motion from Ms. lee second from mr norwood all those in favor raise your hand that passes unanimously dr king cannon you are up next i am i'm gonna bring my pen Okay, I have a few things to share with you this evening. Um, continuing that conversation about facilities projects, um, David and his team have been um, very busy this summer, so I wanted to show you a few things that have been they've been working on, and this is not an all-inclusive list. <laughs> it's been a busy summer, but we're just a few weeks away from starting a school year, and they've been working hard to um, prepare our buildings and facilities. So here's one project, the painting of the baseball outfield fencing. The next one there would be um, removal of the pipe rail and building a safety wall at Bex. So that cafeteria at Bex is two levels and there was a pipe railing there and with the, the young children there, it made sense to remove that and put up the wall. 
Um, the next picture shows a bathroom refresh at Lakewood. We've been able to use the Miracle Method product to help us uh, renovate some of our restrooms over the last few years, and that was a much needed project there. Um, David and his team have been restriping parking lots. And then here's that base, I, we've been calling it the baseball project, but it, it is the repurpose of the soccer locker room. So um, as you recall, you um, asked us to make haste on taking care of that baseball locker room. And so David and Mike have been working to get that done. Jared assisted with some plans and we, um, we had some space at the locker, locker uh, soccer room facility um, that we've been able to renovate and get some space for baseball, uh, for girls power lifting, and for uh, Broncos locker room in the future. So uh, they've been working on that this summer and that will be ready for our kids in the fall. We're, we're um, super excited about that. So thank you for pushing us and appreciate that. Um, and then finally, uh, there's another picture of that locker room project. And then finally, um, our final phase of the Belton High School roof project. So this has been a three-year um, process to replace the roof, and we are on the final phase, and uh, that project should also be completed in time for the start of school. Mm -hmm. So the first day of school, um, some back-to-school activities is August 20th. That's your next board meeting, and that's just five weeks from today. Um, the summer certainly has gone by really fast this year. Um, and so you're, go you're going to start seeing things pick up pretty quickly from uh, now until August 20th. In fact, I think our cross-country team started practicing today. Um, this morning, uh, the band will start next week uh, with full band practices. And then um, volleyball and football will start at the beginning of August. And you know the kids are coming when you see cross-country team running and the band practicing. Um, and then it's about that time. We have student registration dates and times by campus, which are on the district's website, uh, along with open house and meet the teacher information. You may have seen those circulating already on social media. There's been quite a, I've seen quite a bit of buzz about them. Um, and then uh, Bob reminded us that we are expected to grow by 433 students this year, um, which would put our enrollment at 11,963 students. So I think it's possible that we might hit 12,000 um, this school year uh, by the time we hit our snapshot date at the end of October. So if you're new, um, Chris, for you. Um, we do an official count at the end of October and um, we, we watch our enrollment very closely and then the state counts us as a, gives us our official count the last Friday in October. Um, freshman focus for both of our high schools is scheduled for August 7th. New teacher orientation also begins on August the 7th. And I will be welcoming all of our new teachers um, at a luncheon on August the 7th at 11.30. And that I'll send you a calendar invite. That will be at South Belton Middle School this year. And I would love for, for you to attend if you can make it. Um, and then the next day, on August the 8th, all of our teachers will be back on contract. That's also the date of our convocation event. Um, and convocation will be held at 8.30 a.m at the Expo Center, um, and of course, we, uh, we would love to have all of our board in attendance at that event. So August 7th and 8th, back-to-back uh, -back events, if you can make them. And then um, finally, this year's theme, uh, which we'll, we'll put a graphic up here for you in a few minutes, is called Creating Moments That Matter. Um, and that's going to be a significant theme for us this year. You have, um, you've all been given the book, The Power of Moments, and we're basing our our theme around that book and some other work that we're doing in the district. Do you have some questions? You see y'all looking all around. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to clarify on the time. Is it 8.30 or 8 o'clock? 8.30 for convocation. Okay. Mm -hmm. You'll want to arrive by 8. As you know, there there will be a lot of traffic to the Expo Center. So get, <laughs> yeah, or go early so you can get there. Okay, pre-K roundup. We um, wanted to point out some additional steps that we've taken this year to ensure that we get our 
um, students qualified for pre-K. So when we talk about our students who um, have the greatest need, it's important for us to make sure they get start, a good start with pre-K. So um, some new things we're doing this year. Next, uh, beginning next week, we will host pizza and pre-K events at Leon Heights, Miller Heights, and Southwest Elementary. Um, each school will have their own night, July 24th through the 26th. And this idea um, came from the principals of those schools in a conversation that we had in a book study. And I'm really proud of them for going, taking that extra step to personalize this at their schools. So we'll host those events. Um, and then we'll, you'll begin to see some banners um, around the community advertising um, our pre-K roundup, which will be held July 30th and 31st this year. That's slightly earlier um, than in the past. That's to help us make sure we help kids get transportation settled early. Um, Pre-K is always a challenge when we register for school with uh, transportation. We want to make sure we offer them some additional support. Um, and so that's the fence graphic there. So. Um, you shouldn't miss that if you're out and about in the community. Um, so I've, I'd like to thank Elizabeth and Robert for helping us with that. Um, they've spent a significant amount of time making sure we're getting the word out about pre-K registration. Um, and our goal is really make sure the kids have the foundation they need um, starting in pre-kindergarten. Okay, uh, moving along to the retreat. And here's that graphic that we're so proud of. Um, our retreat is going to be held on August the 1st through the 3rd, um, and I'm really excited about it. It's something that we've been um, talking about for many months in our office. Uh, we have three great days planned for our staff, and our focus is on um, safety and security, but we're going to do that in a unique way um, using an innovation and design thinking process. So working with Google, Google is sponsoring um, the first two days of our training, and they're going to provide facilitators for us out of Atlanta from the O'Brien group, um, and they're going to guide our discussion um, and help us learn a process for design thinking um, and so that we can use that for school improvement and to really focus on culture that will make a difference to safety and security. Um, we have a couple of guest speakers. On the second day, we have Maureen Molak as our guest speaker. She's the mother of David, um, who is a young man who could, committed suicide due to cyberbullying um, and whose story resulted in legislation about cyberbullying in the state of Texas known as David's Law. Um, so we're excited to have Maureen as a special guest. And then on the third day, um, our special guest is Alyssa Parker. Um, who will speak to us at breakfast. And she is the mother of Emily Parker, who was one of the ch 20 children who was um, tragically killed in the Sandy Hook school shootings in 2012. Um, and that event on the third day is being sponsored by our cent Central Texas Council of Governments Emergency Services Program. So we'll have some peace officers in attendance for that breakfast meeting. Um, and then Chief Ellis and his team are going to work with our staff um, after our special speaker, and they're going to provide some citizens response to active shooter events, craze uh, training for all of our administrators and leaders. So we have uh, three really good days planned. Um, we're going to connect all of the work that we're doing to the power of moments and this theme, uh, creating moments that matter for our kids. And so we're excited. Um, and then in addition, I gave you another book tonight because we love, we love good books. Um, we're going to focus on building some leadership competencies um, for design thinking, uh, using the ideas from that book called Design Thinking for School Leaders that um, kind of builds on the work that we did last year with mindsets and ties into the designing process and uh, should be very powerful for us as we um, continue to work on school improvement. Any questions? All right. Thank you. All right, next is the review and discussion of Belt and ISD's comprehensive safety and security elements. Anna? All right, so this kind of builds on um, 
Where I left off with the retreat, um, school safety uh, has been a topic of great conversation across the nation and the state in recent months. And so tonight I want to spend some time thinking uh, with you about the topic. And I want to share our district's comprehensive safety and security elements. But we want to start with the why. Um, and this is the why. This picture is what it's all about. It's all about these kids. Um, the safety and well-being of our students is our highest priority, um, and we want to keep them at the forefront of all of the decisions that we make regarding safety and security planning. Um, and then closely followed um, by the students is our staff. We want to keep them um, in mind as we design as well. So each spring, um, we go through a planning process, and you all do, you all guide that development process um, by adopting goals for the upcoming school year. And you did that in April, um, and then we use those goals in our district improvement plan that we're currently working on now. And then that plan serves as our blueprint for all of the work that we do throughout the school year. And we've had a goal in that plan for many years. This goal four that says Belton ISD will sustain a safe and supportive learning, a uh, supportive environment to provide a secure, nurturing, non-threatening, respectful, and disciplined learning environment where all members excel and exhibit moral excellence. And it's not a new goal to us, but um, the recent events have led us to really examine how we can develop new and effective strategies and activities for ongoing improvement. And we've been thinking about that um, over the last several weeks as we've um, prepared for the new school year. So the new strategies that we'll talk about tonight will be presented to you in the district improvement plan in August for your consideration. Um, and they will coincide with the start of the school year as they do um, every year. So by the time you see that plan, um, you should be familiar with many, if not most, of the goals, strategies, and activities that are in there because um, we have had some discussions all along the way about the plan. Um, and your input has been received in multiple formats, um, including the superintendent's performance goals, uh, which we talked about in February. Those you will see in the plan as well. So you're, you are to be commended for um, the importance that you've placed on thoughtful planning thoughtful goal setting for um, continual, continual improvement in this area. Um, also, in addition to your work and oversight as the board, our DWIC committee also reviews and discusses the district improvement plan each year, and all of our directors have contributed to the planning process, and we've spent a lot of time this summer uh, meeting and talking about the plan. So planning is um, cer certainly something that we take seriously in Belton ISD. So this summer we've had some uh, lengthy conversations about board goal four. Um, we spent a good deal of time reflecting on our efforts in this area um, and what we've done over the last few years to improve safety and security. And we've considered how we might improve moving forward. And so as we discussed the topics, um, we identified five elements of comprehensive safety and security that we're focused on to meet board goal four. And so those elements um, shown on this slide that Robert has developed for us are facilities and devices, human resources and partnerships, communication, training, and then most important of all, our students. So I'd like to discuss each one of those elements with you and then um, in, in doing that we'd like to explain some of the things that we've had in place and what we're moving toward um, as we as we continue to improve. And I think it's important to note again um, that you the things we'll discuss tonight will be in our district improvement plan um, and we um, we may add to it is a live plan. We may add to that as we continue our conversations with our leaders as we design with Google in early August. So that first element there is facilities and devices. Um, and this includes many things that we put in place over time. So these are things like security cameras, fencing, drug dogs, safety vestibules, 
Um, it also includes our processes for locking classroom doors, our expectations for wearing student identification badges, both students, uh, students and staff, uh, the use of the Raptor system for conducting background checks on visitors, um, and more recently, the addition of campus alarm systems and uh, safety vestibules. Planning for improvement in this area um, includes some additional measures to harden the entrances of our schools. So we want to study access um, issues for all of our campuses, especially the larger ones like the high school. Um, we have installed this summer and plan to use some magnetic locks to limit access from the office into the campus. Uh, for our new campuses under construction, we've included some infrastructure for magnetic card readers, um, and we want to study best practices for limiting access using some digital tools uh, for control, and we've not had that in our district in the past. Um, we, plan to, we plan to increase the use of drug dogs for random searches where appropriate and allowed by policy. We plan to evaluate the use and efficiency of security cameras, and we want to evaluate new products that are being introduced. There are a lot of new products out in the market to enhance safety and security, um, and we want to take a look at those as well as we're planning. So that's um, element one. Element two is human resources and partnerships. Uh, like element one, we've, we've done a really good job in this area. We've implemented some strong practices. Um, over the years, we've developed strong partnerships with the Belton and the Temple Police Departments. We've increased our number of school resource officers. We even identified a sergeant level position to provide oversight of our Belton SROs. At the high school level, we have uh, campus security guards who serve as additional eyes and support for our campus administrators. Um, we have cross, a good number of crossing guards across the district, and we have a good relationship with the Bell County Public District. Um, we've also used the School Safety Center as a resource for emergency planning and training and have conducted all of our required audits in a timely manner. Um, in recent years, we have established more frequent planning meetings with our SROs, and we've shared our facilities with local law enforcement agencies to practice safety drills. And so this next year, we want to do even more um, in this important area. And so with that in mind, I want to introduce um, a couple of people to you. So in February, um, we talked about the addition of a safety coordinator to um, help us uh, meet uh, the safety and security needs of our growing school district. And after carefully reviewing our needs and, under, and through the process of multiple weeks of conversation with our team, we determined that two coordinators um, were needed to ensure that we could meet all of our goals. So tonight, I am pleased to introduce not one, but two new members of our team. And so first, I'm going to ask Doug Taylor to come up. Doug Taylor is, um, that's my, <laughs> thank you. Doug is a um, very familiar face to us. He will work closely with our SROs, our security guards, and our local law enforcement officials to assist us in improving all, in improving all aspects of our comprehensive safety and security elements. Doug has 21 years of law enforcement experience, with the Belton, all with the Belton Police Department. He has served Belton ISD in the past as a school resource officer, as well as our sergeant, supervising our Belton SROs. And most recently, he has served as a police officer for UMHB, working with the K-9 unit in training. As a parent of two high school students, um, Doug has one at Belton High School and one at New Tech High School. Um, and he, as spouse to a Chisholm Trail Elementary teacher, Dana, um, Doug will be a tremendous asset to the district. So pl very pleased to introduce Doug to you this evening. Thank you, Doug. You want to say anything, Doug? You want to say anything? I'm happy to be here at the School Security and Safety. Thank you, Doug. And Doug's been here since July 2nd, and we're using him. 
He's been helpful. He's been in all these conversations helping us plan, and I'm so grateful. So thank you for being here. Appreciate you very much. Do you have any family here this evening, Doug? My wife and uh, two youngest kids. Great. Would you stand to be recognized? All right. Thank you. Okay, I'd also like to recognize our new coordinator of emergency preparedness, Mr. Pete Ramirez. Would you come on up, Pete? Um, with the increasing public interest in policy action on school safety and security improvement efforts, we've hired Pete as our coordinator of emergency preparedness. Pete is the husband of Jennifer Ramirez, our special education director, and he is the father to two Belton ISD students. So see how we got them all connected already. Um, Pete has been employed by the Temple Police Department for the last 33 years. And, and um, I might say I've known Pete for 25 at least of those 33 years. Some of his duties included school resource officer, juvenile investigations, training, supervision, and the development and coordination of public safety plans. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree from Southwest Texas State University. Um, he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to our district, along with a commitment to care for our kids. Um, and we look forward to his assistance in mer emergency planning and preparation, as well as training for students, staff, and community. Thank you, Pete. I'm going to let Pete introduce his family and say anything he'd like to. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to say I'm excited to come back and continue to serve uh, the community as I have in 32 years and the school. So um, my wife, Jennifer, of course, I think she's well known here. <laughs> <laughs> my two boys, Ryan, who's uh, going to be a senior at UTEP. Yay. And then Samuel, who uh, thinks he's a senior. But, uh, he's a senior. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity of working. Right. Thank you, Pete. Yep. So in addition to bringing Doug and Pete in to assist us in all areas, we um, have some plans with their help um, to provide some formal training to our and certification for our security guards through the, that's an area that we uh, actually, that Doug helped us to identify um, some training opportunities with the Texas Department of Public Safety and or um, the National Association of School Resource Officers. Um, and then we want to continue to strengthen um, partnerships and collaboration um, in, with opportunities with other agents such as the Bell County Sheriff's Department um, and even the city of Morgan's Point who will be out close to our uh, new Lake Belton High School. So those guys will help us do that and I'm going to especially excited about that. The next element, um, communication, is another important area of our comprehensive safety and security efforts. And uh, while I think it's been a strength of our district, I think um, there's always room for improvement. Some of the tools that we have been able to use in this area include having phones in every, every classroom. And last year, the board approved funding to update that phone system. Uh, we have communication in written formats, such as our code of conducts and our student handbooks, with al along with emergency flip charts and plans. Um, we have a 911 alert system, which informs the deputy superintendent's office of any calls placed to 911. In fact, I think Dr. Muller called 911, and got, uh, we got an alert over in the office for him <laughs> having accidentally called. Um, and that's important for us to know. Yeah, he did. <laughs> it's like, why well, should tell him that on me? That's kind of funny. Um, uh, but with, that's, a, that's a handy tool for us to have to know where those calls are coming from. He won't live that one down. Um, we have a Skylert messaging system uh, along with other communication tools to keep parents informed via emails, texts, and automated calls. And we really work to push information out to parents. Um, as soon as we can when we have information to do so. Um, then we have a, a robust use of social media and the district's website. Um, our communication staff has done a really good job there. We also have a tip line for reporting safety and security concerns. Um, this year, some of the things we want to do to continue to improve in this area are to review our visitor and building access policies um, and, and communicate 
to parents better on those policies. Um, we want to communicate safety topics out to our staff, students, parents, and community members using multiple formats. We want to review and revise our climate surveys. Um, and then we want to redesign our Tigers Don't Bully campaign into a See Something, Say Something campaign uh, with the goal of getting more awareness of the need for students, parents, and community members to partner uh, with teachers, administrators, and staff on safety. So here's just a quick idea um, that Robert and Elizabeth came up with. I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, they've already started working on some ideas for a campaign, but what we want to do is to really um, fully develop that with the input of our kids and our parents this fall. So we were talking about having some uh, focus groups with students to see what how they can help us design and perhaps even taking them through that design thinking process that we use that our administrators learn um, in early August. So we're excited about that. Um, I might also mention that on Thursday, um, as we were finishing up this presentation for you all tonight, the Secret Service released a guide uh, for preventing targeted school violence. And in reviewing their recommendations, it was notable that reporting mechanisms are significant and central to the safety and security of schools. So everyone has a role in uh, the safety and security of our schools including our students and parents. So this is an area where we can um, certainly um, build something, design something that will help us. The fourth element of comprehensive safety and security is training. Um, and each year our staff is provided training on campus emergency procedures and drills, which are conducted on campuses. Um, also, with the assistance of law enforcement, we have conducted intruder assessments on all of our campuses. Um, and then we've had some other training which has occurred um, during conversations at district um, and campus safety committee meetings. We've also trained our bus drivers on the use of the Safe and Civil Schools Foundations and Champ program, CHAMPS program. Um, and then recently, we've conducted conducted training for our school leaders on the importance of embracing diversity and removing bias in any form from our school culture. Uh, we've used consultants from the Anti-Defamation League who have helped lead us in this effort, and we have um, sent some of our school leaders, uh, many of our school leaders, actually uh, 10 of our leaders now will have uh, participated in Columbia University's Reimagining Education Conference, which has been um, very important to us. This, this past spring, we started um, ADL training with teachers and counselors, and we have some plans to expand that this fall. Um, and then last year, we began using a program called Safe Schools to deliver training modules to staff on topics such as child abuse identification and intervention, harass, sexual harassment and misconduct, youth suicide awareness and prevention, and health emergencies. And I think there's also a cyberbullying uh, module that's new this year. This summer, we expanded our work with Emergency that we started last year with the Ames program. Um, we used a, a program called Solid Roots um, as a tier three intervention in our uh, behavior classroom units. This summer, we trained campus teams on a program called Bridges by the same company. Um, to provide tier two interventions for behavior management. So if you think of um, a classroom, your foundation program would be safe and civil schools, foundations and champs. Uh, students who are struggling a little more with behavior would be bridges, which we've done this summer. And then that third level would be the solid roots program, which we implemented last year um, to begin working on those Ames classrooms. So our teams uh, learn to implement strategies to proactively support students who are struggling with behavior management. Um, it was a really good training session. I was able to sit in on part of that. Really solid. Um, felt really good about it. And throughout this next school year, we have scheduled over 15 days of on-site coaching uh, through Emergency to help our, our campuses uh, continue to learn that program. 
Um, also this year, we want to train our staff in the craze uh, model that I mentioned earlier, civilian response to active shooter events. Um, we want to review and implement threat assessment committee procedures, which was another one of those significant recommendations by the Secret Service, by the way, in the guide that was released. Um, and we want to uh, ensure that we're actively training our staff to identify and intervene with students who may pose a risk. So that's, uh, that's that threat assessment process. Um, and then finally, we want to provide some first aid um, training to our staff. Um, and Doug had some really good ideas in that area. And I'm sure Pete does as well. We just hadn't had the, had the time he starts at the uh, next week. Pete will be with us. And then finally, um, finally, and perhaps the most important um, comprehensive safety and security element is our students. Um, they are the reason we're here, and this is where we want to spend most of our energy. Um, how we connect with them and what, the, what we teach them about social interactions, behavior, bullying, uh, self-management uh, may contribute to the safety and security of our schools greater than any one other single element. Um, and so we want to spend a good deal of our time here. Um, over the last few years, we have focused on uh, in increasing our commitment to strong school cultures. We talked about that a lot last year, as you know. Um, culture has a definite effect on our students. It includes our teaching practices, relationships among students, um, teachers, parents, and administrators. It includes diversity, um, even the sets of beliefs and values that a school shares. Um, and specifically in this area, we have focused on the No Place for Hate initiative. Um, we've provided our students instruction on digital citizenship, and this is an area um, where we want to continue to work. We've also found ways to engage our students in service learning uh, at all levels to develop empathy and compassion for others and to help them understand that they're a bigger part of a community, whether that be their school community or their uh, local community. We've implemented programs with the support of the community, such as the Belton Police Explorers Program, the K Kids Club, the Service Club, uh, Rotary Service Club at Lakewood. Um, and our elementary schools recently have incorporated the use of student clubs to increase student interest and engagement on their campuses. We've also worked on refining our scope and sequence documents for uh, counseling guidance lessons and we have begun to embed social emotional learning concepts into that uh, counseling curriculum. At the pre-K level, we implemented um, a program called Conscious Discipline to develop social skills in our youngest learners. Um, that's been a really great program. And so everything that we do with our students is important to their well-being. Um, and that even includes classroom instruction. And so we've actively sought innovative ways to provide um, engaging instruction through programs like blended learning, uh, online instruction, and even, um, even Belton New Tech High School at Wasco and the project-based learning that we do there um, is a really great option for students who want to learn in a different way. So moving forward, we want to enhance um, our focus on our counseling and support programs for students. And so we've made a couple of changes this summer um, for this next school year. We, um, Kim Christie Anderson will be moving from our curriculum and instruction department um, to Belton High School. So she can serve as our director of secondary guidance and academic advising. Um, and she'll be working with our secondary counselors um, on all aspects of advising and counseling for our oldest students. Um, she'll also, um, yeah, she'll, just, she'll be providing leadership to those counselors at the secondary level, whereas before she had the response, some curriculum and responsibilities and the responsibilities of all of our counselors. So we're focusing um, her work a little bit there. Um, and then tonight, I'm pleased to recommend to you um, a new employee, Dr. Rochelle Warren. I'm going to ask Rochelle to come forward. On up here, Rochelle. And Rochelle is going to be our director of social, if you approve her, 
right? <laughs> she, you have to approve her. <laughs> and we love her, so we hope you do. Um, she will be our Director of Social Emotional Learning and Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. Um, she's worked closely with our district over the last three years. Um, and she's provided professional learning for us on issues of diversity and anti-bias. She has 23 years of experience serving as a principal, a director in HR and professional learning, and most recently as the director of education with the Anti-Defamation League. Um, she has a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of Texas and a doctorate in educational administration from Texas A&M. Um, and she's going to be tasked with helping us increase our capacity for implementing a social emotional learning program and will assist us in the review and design of systems to support our students. And then she's going to provide um, leadership support for our elementary counselors. So uh, we're pleased to have Rochelle Warren and you will have an action item in a few minutes on Rochelle. Would you like to say anything? It's fantastic to move from being uh, one of the supports and vendors and um, infrequent contributors to being one who gets to partner with you day in, day out. And so I've watched phenomenal things happen over these last three years from the sidelines, and I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to get in there and be uh, a full-fledged part of the team. Great. Thank you. You want to introduce your husband? My husband, Michael, um, came down with me today. We are kind of a package deal. Our son, Brandon, is entering his junior year at TCU, and to work today, um, so he was not able to make the trip. Great. All right. Thank you, Rochelle. So, like I said, this has um, been a team effort, and we've been working and thinking about a new school year um, and how to get better. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have this evening. And if I can't answer them, I will ask one of my team members to help me. Um, we've got lots of expertise in the room. Dr. Kincannon, anyone have questions? I do have a, just a really quick question. I've been listening to and reading quite a bit of information about how social media is affecting kids' social and emotional health. So I'm just curious if that's in the plans to work with kids on that kind of how, how to deal with that when, honestly, you're being raised by a generation of parents like me, right? We came in on, like, we didn't really know what we were doing when we started raising kids in the digital age. Maybe our kids will be better parents, quite frankly, than, than we were on that. So, you know, do we have some guidelines or some ways to teach kids lessons on how to handle the pressures of social media? We do, and we have been um, implementing in a pretty comprehensive way training for our students um, starting, um, starting in the younger grades, but particularly with the addition of our multimedia class at the sixth grade, we added some, um, some opportunities there to instruct students on digital citizenship, and then we've continued that with lessons. Um, but that's an area, a, a growing area of concern that we need to continue to work on with our students. I know um, my daughter just graduated. I know all about social media and the impact on, um, on teenagers and children. And so we, we're worried about that um, as, a, as a team and how we can help kids uh, with that social pressure that they have and the networking that they have available to them. And so um, that will definitely be an area of focus. Good question. Any others? Anyone? I guess more, maybe just more of a statement, but we appreciate, and we know from, you know, this, this last school year, we we're, we're kind of having to redefine all of our thinking and as districts go on these issues, uh, because it's not a big city thing anymore. It's, it's hometown, it's Belton type communities. And so, we're having to learn on the fly, and but but I just want to speak on maybe behalf of just myself. But I know how hard you guys are working. Thank you. Because it's so hard to define the threats and the bullies and the things that are going on nowadays. It's when we went to school, the bullies were pretty easy to define, and because it was personal, it was right there in your face. But now with mm -hmm. the social media and the things that go on, we're having to learn on the fly. But it doesn't matter accountability ratings and all these different things if we can't keep our 
kids safe and feel safe, not just the threat, but they feel safe. And so we really appreciate the diligence that you guys, I mean, on a dime, y'all have turned and done so much this summer. Yeah. And we know this is going to be a growing process. And, and, and bringing on these three folks here, I know is going to make a big difference. And so it's a, it's a great... Uh, it's a great sign to the community that BISD's put this at the forefront of what we're doing, and we appreciate your efforts Thank towards that. Thank you very much. We've been processing it. This is not an easy topic, um, and there's no limit to the number of things that you could do to enhance um, school safety and security, and so we want to be very thoughtful about what we're doing, and we wanted to design it um, to fit our community and our schools, and so um, we're not done. Um, this is the administrative team's work with the input of some experts that we have on staff. Um, we have some new, some more experts who have joined us, and we have our campus leaders who have a lot of knowledge, and we want to spend those three days with them in August getting their input and talking about these issues, too. So this is just a start, um, but we're very pleased to have gotten this far and to bring this to you this evening. So thank you for your support. Appreciate that very much. Anyone else? Dr. Cannon, thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't wait to get home and use the term digital citizenship in front of my <laughs> wife and my senior daughter. Um, that'll impress them. So I learned something new. But I, I really, uh, I'll just say real quick, I really appreciate the comprehensive approach that you and your team have have taken and over the years and, and continue to take, and I'm excited about the changes in personnel that you've made um, to Doug and, and Pete, and I've known Pete since I was a kid, uh, but to Doug and, and to Pete, um, first, thank you for your many years of service to our community, but thank you in advance for doing what you're about to do for our school district and for our kids and, and community uh, in these new roles so thank you for that. Uh, Kim, I don't, is Kim Christy Anderson here? Let's see, Kim. Um, just even though she's not here, thank you to, to Kim also for taking on this important role that she's about, about to undertake. And Dr. Warren, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Belton. Thank you for everything you've done the last three years uh, in your, your partnership with, with Belton ISD. And we look forward to having you full time. Uh, and you are a big piece of um, our plan. So thank you. All right. Okay. And Dr. Kinkinnon, thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, next up, we have a presentation, annual report from the Belton Educational Enrichment Foundation and Julie Bryan. Hey, Julie. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. Thank you for coming. Thank y'all for having me. Do I just push this button? I think. I think they'll do it for you, Julie, okay. if you yeah. just tell them when. Yeah. We'll take care of you here. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, again, thank you guys for having me. Um, my name is Julie Bryan. I'm the president of the Belton Educational Enrichment Foundation. And for those of you that don't know, it's an organization, nonprofit, that was founded in 1992 by alumni of Belton ISD to help support the school district through um, teacher grants, student scholarships, and paraprofessional grants. Um, we have 26 board of directors who uh, work tirelessly throughout the year to engage the community to help raise money and to um, try to be the best stewards of that money to um, the students and teachers and staff at, at Belton ISD. <coughs> and um, we currently have over $1.3 million in assets um, that come largely from our donors that in, invest funds that we're able to grow and keep supporting the, the school district. So um, we're very proud of that, and we, seeing what growth has been taking place and what we're looking forward to, we are trying hard to find new ways to raise money and to continue to be able to support the students and staff here at BISD. Um, we have a great board of directors um, that work on several different committees to help raise money throughout the year. Um, a group that raises money and the group that helps give it away um, through our prize patrol and the student scholarships at the end of the year. We have um, teacher grants, which is part of the prize patrol in December and giving those funds away in January as well. Um, we do scholarships at the end of May or before the kids graduate. 
We have a golf tournament in March, which has now turned into a golf tournament slash tennis tournament. Um, this was our second year to do the tennis, and it was a great success. We had a lot of new um, engagement from community members um, that don't necessarily want to play golf but love to play tennis. So that was a great time to get together. Um, our employee camp campaign kicks off in August and September. And we have our big red carpet event, which is um, one of our biggest fundraisers in October. Uh, you can mark your calendars. It's going to be October 9th this year, which is a Tuesday out at Ten Rock. Just have a few pictures here from the red carpet 2017. Um, we raised over $70,000 for um, Belton Educational Enrichment Foundation. We uh, pride ourselves on having as few expenses as possible. We have a part-time admin. But other than that, um, most of the money that we raise uh, through our events goes directly into BISD, either through student scholarships or um, projects that we do for the district or the student, um, the teacher grants. Scholarships this year. Um, last year, we awarded 213800 And this year, we awarded $222,400. Uh, between Belton High School and Belton New Tech. So uh, we try he hard each year to increase um, our fundraising so that we can give more and more money to the students as they head off into their post-secondary education. We've got a few more pictures of those events as well. We had the Belton High School ceremony on May 17th at the PAC, and New Tech's was May 22nd at South Belton Middle School. Um, also had an, the honor of attending the Superintendent Scholar Program January 17th. And um, one awesome thing that we were able to do this year is through the help with the Carpenter Foundation, we got a grant for $15,000 that we were able to give to the school district to help support Dr. Cannon and her vision with the Superintendent Scholar Program. And we're excited about that and to see where that goes in the coming years. Some pictures of the golf tournament and tennis tournament. Um, this year we raised over $25,000 that went towards the scholarships and teacher grants. And prize patrol, this is from December of 2017. Um, we gave $46,500 in teacher grants and uh, $12,275 in paraprofessional grants. And those are for the staff of BISD who are continuing their education. And um, we try to help them by su uh, supporting them in their schooling. Um, if any of you board members want to be a part of the prize patrol, we would love for you to be a part of it in December. It's really an exciting time to see um, how innovative and how excited our teachers are um, they're not just sitting behind a desk or coming into school and leaving each day. Um, they're wanting to do more, and they're excited about doing more and teaching our kids. So we, in turn, are excited uh, to be able to support that and to help them, and especially the kids. Just more pictures. So this year we've had some great things happening. We'll be, um, as you know, moving the bricks from the Belton High School to the Pittenger Fine Arts Building. Um, we have committed for the past three years $5,000, um, so a total of $15,000 that we'll be able to support that um, and help with the brick walk out here at the Pittenger Fine Arts Building. Um, we had a new donor management portal that went live in May. Um, already been a success um, helping us raise money both with the selling of bricks um, we'll use it for um, getting information out for our events like the um, red carpet event and golf tournament um, it'll allow us to keep a uh, better handle on our relations with our donors um, to continue to raise money um, told you a little bit also about the partnership with the district on the superintendent scholarship program and we're excited to continue to do that um, we also have a donor that specifically um, provides funds for the top um, scholars in the in the district. Also wanted to let you know, I didn't have it up here, but um, the staff at BISD raised over $26,000 this year through our employee campaign, which will be starting up here at the beginning of the school district or the school year. Um, and again, that's money that just pretty much goes directly towards the scholarships 
and the teacher grants. Um, I want to thank you, the district, um, the board, both as a board and individually, a lot of you that um, help support BEEF. Um, we're proud of the district and we're honored to, to be able to do this. So we appreciate all the support from the school district and the community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Anyone have any questions for Julie? I'm coming back on B. We're excited to have you back. <laughs> as, as, your, as a non-voting member, apparently, this time. So I don't know if that means less or more commitment. <laughs> but anyway, we'll I'm excited. You know, I was on B for years, and it's, it is, has a real special place in my heart because I know what it does. And, and as a teacher, on that side of it, that's the part I see first. And then I also see the scholarships for the kids. But it is just a joy to be a part of. Every part of it is fun. And... Um, I'm looking forward to, to going back on. Well, we're glad to have you back. And yeah, it's it's exciting. It's exciting what we do and um, what we get to do for the kids and the students. So we appreciate that. Your support of the superintendent scholars program has um, been really great, Julie. We, um, we have students who have even emailed us their SAT scores this summer. <laughs> And they're really good. <laughs> so um, we have them motivated like never before to really study. And so the, the money that you're providing for incentives and the extra work we're doing with them is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Okay. This is an item that we need to take action on. Um, so I'd entertain a motion on the administration's recommendation that we continue to support the Belton Educational Enrichment Foundation for the fiscal year 2018-2019. Motion for Mr. Camden, second for Mr. Floor. All in favor, raise your hand. It passes unanimously. Thank you all. Okay. Next up, Vicki Dean with, uh, I think this is our fourth. Yeah. Presentation. <laughs> four of four, is that right? No, four of five. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I thought it was three of... Oh. Okay, my apologies. Oh, no, um, that's okay. <laughs> you will see me again. I could have sworn last time. All right. Well, that's good. Hey, I love these presentations. So. Well, great. I'm so glad you look forward to these. All right. It's all yours. All right. Um, well, this evening, um, we're going over Domain 3. Um, <coughs> no, it's cute. So, um, just to remind those of y'all who have not heard this, um, our change in our accountability system is all based on House Bill 22 that was passed um, over a year ago that establishes that schools and school districts need to have a rating of A through F. And so, that goes into effect this year. So this year, um, the districts will be rated A through F, and campuses will just receive a rating of improvement required or met standard, and then next year it goes into effect for districts and campuses. Um, <clears throat> and those ratings um, should come out in August. Um, it's always a should, but um, you'll for sure either hear from me in August or you will hear part five in September. So um, probably most likely in September. So. so there are three domains in our new accountability system. So this is just kind of a review. Um, domain one is student achievement, which we um, discussed um, a couple of board meetings ago. And then last board meeting, we discussed um, domain two, which focuses on um, student growth or um, looking at performance um, gaps. And then domain three, which we're going to talk about tonight, discusses closing the gaps. And so domain one, um, when we talk about elementary and middle schools, um, I only look at STAR data, look at student achievement. And then high school, we look at not only STAR, but college and career military readiness and um, graduation rates. And then domain two, which we discussed last time, that talks about either academic growth, um, looking at prior year's performance and how did we grow that student, or it looks at relative performance and comparing what, how we performed and how we should have performed. Um, and we have that nice um, 
part of a regression best fit um, <clears throat> and that. So when we look at how we calculate for this next year, 70% of our overall grade for the district will come from domain one or the best of domain two part A or part B. So whichever one is the best score is what's going to be calculated to 70%. So tonight, which is domain three, which is closing the gaps, which is the federal requirement, so looking at, um, looking at the law of every student succeeds at compliance, so the ESSA compliance com um, piece of it. So House Bill requires us to look at desegregated data. How does all our sub-pops do? How does a special ed and LEP and, and comparing all of those? Um, breakdown. <clears throat> so the feds, um, if you've kept up with um, any of the correspondence, first didn't like um, what the state was coming up with in the accountability system and said, no, you, you need to revise it. So this is what the state of Texas has come up with revisions based on um, federal recommendations. So it's going to look at multiple things. So first, it's going to evaluate all these student groups. It's going to look at how did all our students do. It's going to look at um, ethnicity groups or racial groups and the breakdown of all those groups. It's going to look at how our students, the economically disadvantaged students, our current special ed students, also our former special ed students, so if you um, are no longer identified as special ed, it will look at those students. How are those students performing? It will look at also our current and monitored English um, language learners. It will look at also they want us to look at our students who are continuously enrolled in our district, so who've been here for three or more years. And if you haven't been here three or more years, then look at those are consider non-continuously enrolled students. So there are some new um, categories that school districts that we've never looked at before. We've never looked at former special ed students. We've never looked at continuously enrolled or not continuously enrolled. Um, so those are some new things um, that we're being held accountable for in domain three. So then you ask, okay, so what are we going to be held accountable for? So there are some components of that. So it's going to look at star achievement on meets and masters. So you can see that it does not look at um, what percentage of African American students approached. It only wants us to re look at and compare African American students, how many meets and masters on the star how many Hispanic students meets and masters. So we're, um, we're looking at that component on an academic achievement. It also wants us to look at um, growth. So that domain two on um, part A in elementary and middle schools, or if at the high school and the district level, it's looking at what percent of students who are graduating in four years and all those sub-pops. And then it also is going to look at performance of our English language proficiency. So that's our TELPASS data. Um, we have a waiver this year because there were some changes in TELPASS. Before um, speaking and listening, um, the teachers rated the student this past year. All that went online that students um, recorded took the speaking and listening online. So since they haven't set the pat what those standards are, um, we're not using that data this um, coming year in domain three. And then the final component that it's looking at is school quality or student success. So it's looking at, um, once again, the STAR component um, for domain one for elementary and middle schools. And then at the high school and district level, it's looking at um, our career and college and military readiness. So our CCMR data for each of those subgroups of different components. So domain one, you know, you might ask, well, what's the difference between domain one and domain three? Domain one looks at all students and just gives an overall um, percentage 
where in domain three, it's gonna break it down. So what does that look like? So y'all have, um, there's this chart, and um, you probably can see it better um, in your presentation, but this is what domain three looks like. And so um, when we talk about the first component of looking at star data, it will, um, we have different targets. And so it looks at, okay, did all students meet that target? You get a yes. Did all African American students get that target? And every subgroup has a different target, um, depending on um, <coughs> um, who it is and what um, that, that subgroup is. So then it takes how many yeses did you get and then gives you a percentage of that. So that's um, kind of how domain three is calculated. So um, we take all the data and dump it into a nice pretty spreadsheet that gives us colors and voila. So I wish it was that easy. But um, <clears throat> So that's how domain three is calculated, is looking at all those, all these different components based on all these different um, student groups that are evaluated, <clears throat> and then if they meet the target or not. So that's kind of how domain three is calculated. So is it possible that one student could be counted three or four different times depending on what categories they fit in? Yes, so if you are African American, economically disadvantaged, and special ed, you could be counted in all those, and all. Pass or fail depending on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So, it, during our SLI training last month, I think we all did what? I did four hours and 15 minutes, I guess, all together on A through F. I think it's easier to put people on Mars, to be honest with you, than to understand <laughs> some of this stuff. So, when, do, when, does, when does the when do we start hearing some, some like the A through F? Now, is district, is that this August is when we're going to get a district? Right. So within a, a month, th that's... Okay. So rating. what is a realistic rating at this point? Because we all know what Belton ISD is. We're, we're good. <laughs> so what is realistic? Because I know what a C means in my house. Right, right, We don't right, talk right, about right, C's right. in my house. <laughs> So what's this? And people aren't going to know what this is all about. Right. I'm not even sure I do. The chart looks like spaghetti to me, really. So when when what is a realistic expectation based on what we're seeing through the data that we've been getting through the reports? What what is realistic for districts to hope for this first time out? You know they're not going to let us have A's. You know we don't know. We don't uh, until we, don't. we see the numbers. Till we see the data flow through this formula that the state has come up with, we don't know what our rating. So it's it's very study. difficult to predict. Now, I, you know, I, if I were to make a guess based on the demographics of our district, because I think these ratings will be tightly correlated with demographics, I might venture to say a B but, and hope for an A, but I don't know until we see it all work through the system. Um, it's very complicated, and and like we've said in the past, having a rating uh, or a specific grade, an A, B, C, D, or F, is only reflective of the formula that was used to get that grade. So all of those things we talked about tonight is in our comprehensive safety and security um, elements, those aren't included in the system. So we are much, much more than what is what we're being graded on um, and I think we have to keep that perspective in grade but we don't know we don't we won't know until we get it and we know we've been making significant gains in our testing we've been doing very very well and you know the concern of course of this new rating system is that the public will be like well I mean it's, it would just be natural right to say well a C is bad but it's a C based on a certain criteria Right. that does not necessarily reflect your success. And it's, it's just the PR part of that is going to be a little bit complicated, helping people understand. Just look at what we're doing. Look at the gains we're doing. Let's look at, let's look at our individual students. They're more than this. Yeah, I think, Anna, I think it would be difficult to 
um, discuss the quality of a school system based on one this one particular rating alone. <clears throat> when, you, when you look at our college career, and what's the third of that? Military. 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 When you look at us overall, GISD, man, they're awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah. We, we do. We fare well against the state and certainly against the region, and um, we should do as well as anyone else. <laughs> under the system we just don't know what it looks like yet yeah it's an unfortunate naming yeah. for the for the stratifications right because I, you know we do have you know a, a tendency to think about what what a c means right right and it, it doesn't mean the same thing that an a through f in a classroom does that's correct So, um, so then a, another component of domain three is all those components are weighted, of course, uh, depending on um, which component that is. So as you can see, um, based on the charts, academic achievement for elementary and middle schools are only 30% of the, um, the grade where at the high school and district, they count as 50%. So um, depending on what um, campus you are or district um, depends on the percent of what that component's worth. And so um, just another layer of the complication of, of calculating all this data. <clears throat> so to wrap up, all three domains and how um, when this when we get our, our final score, 70% um, of it comes from domain um, one or two part A or two um, part B, <laughs> and then 30% comes from domain three. So um, depending on which one's your best score for one, two, A, one, two, B, um, and then you multiply that times 70% and then add that to the 30% of domain three. And that will give you your overall score, which then the state um, translates that to a scale score. Then that translates to your grade, your letter grade. Did anybody that? Yeah, that was me. Yep. <laughs> so... Um, so if you find me underneath my desk, that is why. <laughs> Just trying to figure so it out. Any other questions about any of those the domains that we've covered so far? Okay, clear as mud. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yes, any thanks. questions? Oh, uh, you're welcome. It's been um, it's helped me to really kind of clarify. Um, <coughs> kind of getting it in my head too. All right. Anyone have any other questions? All right. I think that's it, Vicki. Hey. Thank you. You're up next, too. I am. I am. Summer this is more fun. Program. Yeah. Things that we've done this summer that are um, very exciting. <clears throat> and this is a report of everything that's taken place pretty much the month of June. Um, we've had a, a, we had a real busy uh, month of June. And when um, I was looking at the district goals, um, they really pretty much aligned to um, the offerings that we've had this summer of looking at meeting um, our changing of our student needs, um, looking at building success um, through um, live um, learning, getting kids to be leaders. We've done some things. Um, exposing them to positive role models, them being positive role models, um, offering those supportive schools. Um, we did some things in SAIL to, um, <clears throat> to strengthen our community partnerships, um, and then also making sure that we meet the needs of those requirements um, that we need to for by law. So we offer... Um, one of the first things that we um, look at is credit recovery at the secondary level. I um, mean, you can see um, that data of the number of students that recouped credit um, for this past year. Um, we looked at kind of, we're, we've been working at the secondary level to kind of rethink um, credit recovery. Um, and Ms. Ross um, has been real good of, of us working through those conversations we we'll are continue that work for next summer also. 
And then we also offer some credit for acceleration at the secondary level, um, looking at for PE and art and, um, and um, those courses. And then um, a lot of our, our biggest part of our work is um, looking at STAR remediation for our student success initiative for those SSI grades for fifth and eighth grade, and then also EOC prep. Um, EOC prep. Um, fifth and eighth grade, that's required by law. Um, the summer EOC retesting is not required, so students aren't required to retest in June. Um, but it's encouraged. So we offered um, scores came out a little later this year since May testing was later. So we pushed back um, when we were going to intervene for fifth and eighth grade students. And um, that allowed a lot more um, kind of some targeted planning at those two grade levels. And then for EOC prep, we offered a, a week of um, acceleration for EOC. Um, there's a lot of districts in the state that um, offer that, so some targeted time right before the test. Um, the students and the teachers um, really like that. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing what those scores look like um, at the end of July. So you can see those numbers of students who retested. Another thing that we did differently um, this summer is um, we've been already testing online at Belton New Tech and had already done a lot of testing online at Belton High School and sprinkling at the middle school and elementary schools. Um, but with um, some changes with um, online supports, we tested all students online this summer, um, so <clears throat> which was a, a positive um, change um, to help with preparation for testing, and then also allowing students to have those additional um, supports online. So one of our, we offer um, uh, multiple camps in the summertime. We have a GT summer camp um, that focused on um, looking at computer programming, um, looking at um, some um, science, um, pretty much a lot of STEM things that were offered in GT summer school. Not summer school, but summer camp. Yeah. <clears throat> we had over 200 students that attended over the course of two weeks. So um, a lot of fun. You can see um, some pictures there, and then I added some pictures at the end. Um, we offer an English language summer program um, that's required um, by law for kindergartners and first graders, and then a newcomers program. Um, we focus a lot on language acquisition skills, um, giving them a variety of experiences um, to increase um, just talking and um, getting them to have that head start before they get into um, to kindergarten into first grade or second grade. And then we um, offer extended school year, and this is for students who are receiving special education services um, that need that continued instruction through the summer. Um, so it's offered in June and July on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and we offer that at Sparta and Belton High School. So I have almost 50 yeah. students who participate in um, ESY. And then um, Summer Adventures in Learning, SAIL. This is our second year to offer um, SAIL um, for Miller Heights and Southwest students. And then this year we added um, Project Heartbeat students to attend. Um, so we had um, <clears throat> almost 100 students who attended SAIL. Um, they off they um, are exposed to a variety of different classes that they rotate through. So through those three weeks, they got to experience all those um, classes or courses. Um, <clears throat> the students um, love it. This year, I think one of their favorite classes was fishing. Um, we offered fishing um, that Michelle McKeska um, partnered with Texas Parks and Wildlife to do that. Um, <clears throat> they like the animal class. Um, we also offered a financial literacy um, um, 
course that students um, enjoyed. And we also, this year we did our scheduling a little different for um, our fifth grade SSI students to be able to um, go through some of these courses. Um, so they got to go through financial literacy and be a part of that. Um, and even the fishing course, just to kind of give them some um, fun things to do in the summer. <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned um, earlier, one of the things that was added this year um, from, um, the, from the initiative of the, the teachers um, in SAIL is they partnered, the financial literacy teacher partnered with Helping Hands and had a lemonade stand every Thursday. And they raised over $179 that they donated um, to that <clears throat> organization. And then Susan Bell partnered with um, the Belton Retired Teachers Association, and those teachers um, showed up um, that last week and handed out books to students. Um, and <clears throat> they were very excited to get those, so to continue their reading through the summertime. And then um, a, a camp that we offered that was new this year that was not um, funded through um, Belton ISD money but um, was self-sufficient was through um, Camp Invention um, that was at Belton High School. We had 120 students and they went, it's all STEM activities that they went through um, different courses as you can see. Um, a cool thing was the pet vet thing that each day they took um, an animal that they had programmed at the beginning of the week and then by the end of the week they had made a dog park that their dogs could interact with each other. Um, so that was, it was, that was pretty fun to see. <clears throat> Another thing is you can see it might look like it's a mess that's on the um, bottom corner that um, they use all recycled materials to um, create um, like a house, um, some different things by using recycled materials. So um, it was just this area, oh, go get what your materials that you need. So um, that was a lot of fun to see um, the kids um, get excited about that. So we plan on continuing um, that um, camp invention next year. So here's some additional pictures. It's really hard to take a um, hundred and something pictures and then try to pick out the ones that you want to put in this, but they're um, a lot of fun. So as you can see, we offered a lot of opportunities this summer. Um, <clears throat> look forward to next summer and seeing where we can take um, sell, um, reevaluating our secondary um, credit recovery program and then um, expanding our GT camp and camp invention. This kind of stuff makes me so happy. <laughs> I just love that we do this for kids and it's offered in so many different varieties and ways, and groups and different learning abilities and everybody gets an opportunity to participate in the summer and and it's fun. It's not punitive. It's it's fun, and it makes them want to learn. I just thank you so much. Makes me happy to be a part of the district. Yeah. It is fun. Yay. Yeah, the great feedback from the kids. I had the pleasure of driving the dad wagon and dropping them off. Uh, <laughs> you know, at uh, at the camp, and I had a couple at. Uh, was dropping off at the coding camp and they just were just so jazzed and uh, got home and wanted to continue working on it on their own. So, yeah, I mean, just, you know, really got them pumped to continue that learning outside. Um, a couple questions early on. So the, the uh, credit recovery and the star remediation, any idea as far as like the population of students that could go through that versus the population of students that actually did go through that? Like as a percentage, are we... How well are the, the students that are potentially eligible to go through that actually attending and participating? So for credit recovery, um, it's a, a pretty good percentage. I mean, I, can, I couldn't do yeah. it right off the top of my head. Um, of the students who are eligible for credit recovery who actually attend and then who actually receive credit, mm -hmm. um, the high school um, does a really good job of recruiting and you know, following through and making that system pretty um Painless for a kid yeah. to um, sign up for that. And then for EOC prep, 
Um, it's probably about a third of students who are eligible for that just because it's not required. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've discussed um, some things for next year of what we can do to, um, to, in to increase that participation. I think um, going online, how I, we saw an increase of, of testing, of students testing this year, and then only having that one week of EOC prep. Because if you don't need the credit recovery before we were asking you to come for three weeks of EOC prep. And so if you only need um, English, you know, let's say algebra one, and you only have to come for a couple of hours for five days, well, that's probably a little more doable for a high school kid. <coughs> so, um, so they're just thinking, trying to think of ways to meet the needs of our the high school students. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Vicki. This is um, a report only, so we're not taking any action on this, but we appreciate it. Very well done. Anyone else have any questions? All right. Next up is our athletics update, our annual athletics update by um, Coach Morgan. Well. I just want to say it's a privilege to, to get to come share with you all a little and uh, just to – have a chance to just remind everyone of how thankful as an athletic staff and athletic department we are to, to work in a place like Belton where we have support across the board. I mean, I could list each individual department and with, with as big a program as we have, there's lots of moving parts and we've always got things going on with transportation and nutrition and grounds and the business office and, and curriculum and everyone else. And from the, from the top administration on down, and it's, it's a real pleasure. And it's also, I would just like to thank the board on behalf of all of our student athletes for the continued support, not just of athletics, but of all extracurriculars. And I, and I do think, you know, being here for a while now, that, that uh, y'all do see the inherent value of athletics and participation and competition and all the things that we are involved in. And I just wanted to take a second to say thank you for all that before we get into the, the data and the report. Um, I think. Well, once again, we included our, our, our athletics vision, mission, and, and objective. Uh, last year, we kind of, we kind of as, a, as a coaching staff with our head coaches and our, and our leadership, we kind of sat down and said, what do we really want to be about? And very little has changed in this from last year to this year. But I do think that one thing I wanted to point out was on our, on our athletic program objective, it really is our goal or our primary objective is to provide the best athletic experience possible for all students in the Belton Independent School District. And I, I think sometimes that, that means different things to different kids. And one of the things we have to do as a staff and as coaches is figure out what, what do we need to do for that student for him to have a good experience or her to have a good experience while they're in our athletic program. And like I say, I don't, I don't want to go through each one of these in detail. Uh, very little has changed since last year, but that is something that, that we do take very personally and that we do try to um, – try to, to adhere to whenever we design our program and, and the experience that we want our kids to have. Uh, we're still very healthy uh, on participation numbers. Our preliminary data, we're up about 35, almost 40 kids from last year. Uh, this doesn't reflect, these, these numbers were ran after the initial registration in the spring, so they're not gonna reflect any move-ins that we may have had since, since uh, you know, late April. Uh, so we expect this number to swell a little, but it will kind of flatten a little bit as we go through the year. And we do have to make cuts in certain sports and uh, some of the things that uh, just natural atrophy that happens in an athletic program. But when you look at it at this number, uh, it almost, you know, it, 1,058 kids. I mean, counting New Tech and BHS, I mean, that's almost a third of our students are involved in the athletic program. And one thing that participation numbers don't always tell the whole tale most of these kids are athletes at some level. Most of them are competing on the court or on the field, but a great number of these kids are also athletic trainers. They are also filmers. They're working, uh, you know, doing daily technology tasks for the athletic department. Some are, we have a whole crew of guys in, in the football program that are equipment guys. They go in, they work in the equipment room every day, and those guys don't usually get a lot of the, 
the glory and the accolades, but we try to make sure that those kids feel important. We have lettering policies for all of them. If you're a filmer or a trainer or a manager, then, then we have ways that, to make sure that you understand you're an important part of our program as well. So, you know, this, this is not just 1,058 kids that are all participating. It's also kids that are learning how to work in a support role as well. And uh, so we're really happy about that. And the participation numbers at the middle school are still solid. Uh, we'll have over 1,000 kids uh, involved in middle school athletics this year as well. So when you look at the entire the entirety of the program, it's a little over 2,000 kids involved in athletics in one way or another. Uh, moving on to the composite standings, this is something I started doing when I took over uh, last year. I think it's important, you know, while, while the, the bottom line doesn't always about wins and losses, but it's a big part of it, especially at the varsity level. And it's, I think the health of your program can be seen in a variety of ways. And one of the ways is in what kind of results are you getting? And, and we were very pleased with the results that we got this year. Uh, in 12 of the 19 measurable sports, about being powerlifting and wrestling are the two sports that we can't measure. Uh, powerlifting, is, it's, not, it's not a UIL sport. We don't have a district level competition in that. And then, and then BISD is not involved in UIL wrestling at this point. So the, the 19 sports that we are involved in, 12 of the 19 we finished in the top two in the district and 16 of the 19 we finished in the top three in the district, which is very pleasing uh, to me is in my position, I, I look at it and see that we got good results this year. Uh, you know, I, I think our, our, the three that weren't in the top three, uh, our boys track team was four points out of being the district runner up. Our baseball team was in second place until the, the last week of the season. We dropped a couple of big games and slid to fourth. And our girls basketball team, I believe they had five games that were decided by five points or less that kind of kept us out of the playoffs. So, uh, you know, even the ones that weren't in the top three, I felt like we were very close. And, and the one I'm really proud of, too, is that eight of our nine teams that could make the playoffs made the playoffs. And, and – uh, and none of our teams were in the bottom two. In fact, a, a tie for fifth was our lowest finish of anything. And you can compare that district-wide. Really, us and us and Midway both had pretty solid, really solid years program-wise. And, uh, and we're really proud of that and proud of the accomplishments of our coaches and our kids in those regards. At the middle school, not to go into too much detail, but we had another good year at the middle school. Uh, really uh, a great class. Uh, at North Belton, eighth grade boys and girls capped off two solid years. And we look forward to those and all the other eighth graders coming into our ninth grade program as, as we get the, the kids from the three schools together and a, a solid seventh grade year all the way across the board as well. So that's going to be fun. And uh, the, the district composite, if you look at the, the, the varsity composite stats, are going to be a lot of fun next year because we're adding two new schools to the district. We're adding Temple and Waco High into the district, and we'll have them for the entire year, and we'll lose San Angelo Central in the six sports they've been completing in, competing in. Uh, one thing, and Coach Cope came tonight, and I want to thank him for kind of heading up our academic program. Uh, I, we didn't include all the information we could have. We kind of said, what do we want to include in this? And, and kind of four facets of what we try to do. Number one is we do collect data. And, and I, I put, we, we kind of made a competition out of it this year. Uh, we wanted to see which ones of our, pro we wanted to track and let the kids see which ones of our programs uh, had the highest AB honor roll rates and which of our programs had the lowest failure rates. And these are the year, yearly totals that are posted here. We track this for each term. And uh, for the first three terms, we were, we were ahead of the, the school average on failure, failure rate by about 4%. And then uh, on the last nine weeks, we slid a little bit. But these that you're seeing here, these are averages of the four terms. This isn't uh, just one, because like football, for instance, uh, the first nine weeks, we had about a three point, um, we had about a, a 5% failure rate, which out of 271 kids is not bad. But as the year went on and football season was over, we've got to find ways to get some of those, some of those numbers up a little bit. Another thing is we try to provide as much information as we can. One of the examples is, uh, is given that we do a, a recruiting seminar uh, each year that we open to the public, parents can come in and we explain the, explain the recruiting process, explain the, the NCAA 
uh, eligibility process and, and try to make that information available to all of our students. We try to do recognition. One of the ways of recognition I put up here was we, we posted a, an academic uh, AB honor roll list that we update every term in our athletic complex. The kids love to come by and see their name on there and take a picture of it and tweet it out or put it on Instagram. Uh, we also try to give as much recognition as we can to our our academic all district and academic all state kids and, and kids as they uh, get accepted to college and those types of things. We try to make a big deal about that. And then the, the last thing is just training. Uh, this was our seventh year with one group of kids to do our, our, uh, our college entrance uh, training with Kim Christie Anderson. We've got some other programs we do and we, were, we met with, with Kim last week actually in her new role and we think we're gonna be able to expand this program probably from just you know, a dozen and a half kids, maybe to up to 30 or 40 kids per year too, with the way we're, some new structures that we're trying to put in place. So academic progress is very important to us. Academic tracking is very important to us. And we want to use athletics as a tool to try to help motivate kids to do the best they can academically. Uh, one of the things that we identified last year is one of our goals in the district improvement plan is, is we needed to, we needed to up our game in community service. Uh, you know, when we say community service, that doesn't mean starting a GoFundMe page. That's not community service to us. Community <laughs> service is we want to get out in the community. We want to get our hands dirty. We want to, in some of the examples you see here, we want to go visit, you know, we want to go visit retirement communities. We want to, to, to I think we, we made over 12,000 meals that we sent to, to Haiti through that, through that group. Uh, you know, we, we had 46 projects we completed this year. Uh, Coach Cope tracked all this. It was 2,226 total volunteer hours, and that came out to about 2.35 hours per athlete, which sounds okay, but except we really push for our varsity kids, and we average that with all of our athletes. So uh, we really require our varsity guys, our varsity groups to get out and do community <laughs> service, but that, that naturally blended down, and we got a lot of our younger kids involved as well. So that, now we have a baseline we have a, a starting point, and now this will be something that will be fun every year to see. Can we get more projects? Can we get more total hours? Can we get our, our total hours per athlete increased? And I, I think that we'll be able to do that, and we'll start pushing that in August whenever we come back with our coaches meeting. But I'm very proud of that. And like I say, it's not about raising money. Very little of our community service was, was money fundraising. It was about going out and helping community events and helping those that, that – that needs people to come spend time with them and need people to, I think we were involved in the, the community wide project where we went and worked in, you know, elderly people's yards and things like that too. So it's some really good things. I picked up track. One of the, my favorite airhead points where I love and I hate how trashy it is all the time. So we got one group out with trash bags and picked up trash at airhead point on a Friday afternoon too. So we're just trying to find things that we can do to help make our community better. Uh, as you saw in the standings, we did have four district champs this year. Uh, very proud of those guys. Uh, we do have a competitive district, lots of lots of good programs, lots of good athletes. But uh, lady uh, cross country, girls swimming, boys golf, and lady tiger softball uh, all won district championships this year. We're also proud of the five groups we had that, that brought home by district championships. That would be volleyball, uh, which broke a, a, a playoff win drought, which was very great. Baseball um, came back and had a solid series and played two rounds. Lady Tiger softball, team tennis, and Lady Tiger soccer all were by district champions as well. This was a really special year in that we also, in our athletic department and in our school district, in our community, we had a state champion and a state record holder in Noah Henry, which was incredible. Uh, it was a great, great meet, and, and Coach Henry's here tonight, but it's, it was a great meet. Uh, the excitement was incredible. And for Noah, who's been such a solid swimmer for us, to finish his career in this way with, with swimming to 47.07 in the, in the 100 fly and not only winning it, but also eclipsing a, a, a six-year-old school record or a state record, I mean, in a very, very incredible day and lots of fun. And uh, we look forward to Noah. We'll be going into our, our BHS Athletic Wall of Honor next year. We're looking forward to that. But that was an incredible day for him, for our school, for our athletic program. Uh, we did have a number of state qualifiers this year. As, as always, our girls' powerlifting program uh, got an incredible amount of, of participation at the state level. Uh, and then we had a boys' powerlifter, Arturo, and then Noah as well. So that, we're really proud of all those kids. Also, our all-state athletes. Um, we had four coming into this weekend that 
the Texas Sports Riders All State softball team came out, and we had five five more girls that were that were honorable mention All State too on that team. It just came out this weekend. But we're very proud of these guys and, and, and young ladies and the, the seasons they had and the careers they've had. And the best thing is for these, Kaylee and Avery are back again next year as well. So they're already two-time All-State performers and they'll be back for their senior seasons next year. I uh, had a good year with the Wall of Honor. Uh, we had kind of having a strange year this year. We, um, we only had one athlete out of the class of 2000. 17 who had qualified and that was Dana Young in powerlifting but we had two two co one former coach and one current coach who were inducted into their their hall of honors their hall of fames this year and one of the criteria for getting into the belt and wall of honor is if you enter as a player or a coach the your sports hall of honor then you're inducted or you're, you're eligible for induction into the to the wall of honor and then we also inducted Kyrie Robinson after a a four-year NFL playing career that hopefully is not over. He's still trying to make a comeback and working very hard, and we, we wish him the best. But we went ahead and felt like it was appropriate time to induct Kyrie. Uh, and he was, he was actually at a tryout with in the Canadian Football League the week of our ceremony. He found out, I think, the night, two nights before. So, um, BeltonTigerAthletics.com, we encourage and, and are trying to get people to use this as, as the source for information about our athletic program. Uh, we, we do very well on page views. We averaged about 57 page views a month for, for the past year. Our highest monthly views were about 97,000. Uh, we were uh, top eight VNN websites. This is the company that we use in, in the nation, eight out of the 12 months. Our highest ranking ever uh, during that period was number two in the nation on total views. And we're at top five views in Southwest region all 12 months. And the main thing is we it's content driven. Coach Skidmore, is is the is kind of the the uh, he's the manager of our website, but but we put lots of pictures, lots of content, lots of stories, and lots of information on there, and, we, and we're really strict uh, about what we want on there, and we want it updated frequently because we want our parents to use this as a resource, not just for results and photos, but to find directions to the game and find out game times and ticket prices and itineraries and all those sorts of things. So our coaches put a lot of work into this. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make it as, as the place to go to for parents and for the community whenever they want to find out information about our athletic program. I had a great year signing. I think last year we had 14 signees. This year we had 25. Um, one thing that's interesting about these two, and, and we include, if someone's a preferred walk-on, we include them in our signees. And that doesn't always show up immediately, but, but generally a preferred walk-on, if they'll show up and do a great job, they generally work their way into some scholarship money at some point. But um, just the estimated single-year impact from this, from this signing class is about $288,000 that, that will be seen immediately this fall whenever school starts. And the, the estimated four-year impact from this signing class is a little over a million dollars. So, you know, obviously there's, there's differences in the level of competition and what the NCAA allows the schools to give out for scholarships, depending on that. But uh, like I say, a very strong senior class, a very diverse class, lots of different sports, uh, lots of different schools they're going to, but uh, definitely represent, will represent Belton well at the next level. And then we have our department priorities. We pull these straight from our district improvement plan. Just like last year, I said one of the one of the priorities we established was to increase our role in community service, and we feel like we accomplished that this year. You know, we have some on here. Uh, we want to. I, I want to point out the ones that I probably are going to take most personally is to increase the number of honor roll students and decrease the percentage of failing students for the fourth term. We have to. We have to create some incentives and some, and some uh, program to try to make sure that we finish the year as strong as we started. Uh, we, we were really proud of our first three term grades as an athletic department. The fourth term, we felt like we fell off a little bit. So that's gonna be one of our priorities this year. Also to increase student athletic attendance at all athletic events. We wanna get cross, cross program support to get soccer kids to the tennis courts and baseball kids to the volleyball gym and football kids to the softball field. And we want to do what we can to get more kids at our events and make the, like I said earlier, create a great experience for everybody. We want to, we want to, we want to make that a priority this year. And then obviously one of, one of my biggest priorities is always to improve communication between all aspects of our program, trainers, parents, coaches, administrators, teachers, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing our job to communicate 
and make sure everyone knows kind of kind of where we're at. And, and this is really where we're at on things. I, like I say, it was a solid year. Appreciate the, the opportunity to come speak with y'all tonight and would open up for any questions that you might have. I have one on the Hall of Honor. When we open up the new uh, Lake Belton High School, did y'all, in the planning of the facility, is there a spot for a wall mm -hmm. for future Broncos? There is. There's going to be some spot in the in the, the, the main entrance on Main Street where the, the fine arts is on one side and the gym is on the other. I believe there's going to be a big spot where we'll be able to get that started for that, for that school. Uh, on the community service front, can, is there a way for us to get some more information on the 46 projects you guys did? Mm -hmm. we, we have a spreadsheet okay. with all of them. Yeah, yeah, I'd love so, to. Yeah, we can, we'll share that. Absolutely. Okay. Send it to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Any questions? Anna, thanks. Board, thank you all. Good Morgan, you. thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well done again. Appreciate the uh, academic focus in there. Um, as I did last year, and on behalf of the board, please give all of our coaches a thank you for the the countless hours and mental and physical and emotional investment they have every year <laughs> in, uh, in instilling or encouraging a spirit of competitiveness among all of our kids. So thank you. All right. Another update. This one on the budget. Yes. We're Good close. evening, President Cowan, board members, Dr. King Cannon. This will be very brief because I was hoping that I would have different information for you tonight, but I don't. So I'm just going to do a recap of what we've been through in the past or what I've been talking about over the past three months. We have our same priorities. These have not changed from the previous three presentations. We continue to remain focused in applying our district resources in various areas to support education of our kids. Uh, with the tax rate, as you can see, our tax rate increased 16.3 cent last year to support the vo voter approved uh, 2017 bond referendum. And we anticipate the same tax rate for the 2018-19 year. And Bob Templeton did a much better job than I could ever do with talking about enrollment and the projections. But I have this in here because I wanted to keep it at the forefront in terms of your letting you know how important enrollment is to our funding on both sides, the revenue and expenses, because as we increase, we have higher expenses, but we also get a little more revenue for the kids that we have that come into the district. Our general fund budget is, is am I going the wrong way? Okay, preliminary values. I was hoping this would say certified, but it doesn't. But just wanted to remind you that right now at our estimated taxable value of $3.1 billion, we are expected to generate about $35 million in local tax revenue. And at this point, we are holding fast until we get our certified values. I'm wondering if those got caught in spam. This after, they, we were told they would be here this afternoon. Yeah, they were but, supposed to come in this afternoon. Yeah, but we don't have them. Okay, I'll yeah. check as soon as I get back. But we'll, as soon as we get them, we'll be working diligently to update the numbers for you all. And we're real close. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like an email away. Yeah. <laughs> an email yeah. away. Yeah. Numbers are there. Mm. I know. None of our assumptions for the general fund has changed. Neither have the expenditure assumptions. And on the general fund revenue, again, we're just waiting on the certified values to see where we are going to land here. We, we do anticipate uh, some significant, or some, I shouldn't say significant, but definitely some changes based on preliminary, on the certified values. In terms of the budget, we did have some changes here. We had about $375,000. Uh, we added that to the budget to support some E-rate initiatives that were going to come out of fund balance. I do want to make a point that I think I forgot to make in the previous presentations is that you see this $100 million in expenditures, but I wanted to to let you know that about $1.4 million of this amount are expenditures that we are 
using fund balance dollars for. And the only way to use fund balance is to put the, that expenditure amount in your actual budget. So just be cognizant of that when you see this slide and you see that at our preliminary values, if, expend, or if our certified values come in at the preliminary value rate, we would take about 1.8 million from fund balance, but again, about 1.4 million of that is planned expenditures from fund balance. And if preliminary, if certified values come in at about 8%, that is even more favorable for us. So we actually would take a lot less out of fund balance and we would in, in essence be able to cover from general operating some of those items that we had planned to take out of fund balance. So that would create a slight surp surplus in terms of what we had originally budgeted. With school nutrition, we did have one change in terms of our assumption. Last time I talked to you, we were really trying to be aggressive and add Leon Heights as a CEP campus. We made the we originally assumed that our CEP reimbursement, not the rate, but the reimbursement percentage would go down next year. But after consulting with Region 12, we, were, we learned that that rate would not in fact go down. We were grandfathered in for three more years at a higher rate or at a higher percentage. So after looking at all the factors and if we added Leon Heights, our rate would drop significantly. And so we, we realized that it was not economically feasible for us to add C Leon Heights as a CEP campus. And also we, we are con constantly watching our free and reduced lunch percentage because as our free and reduced lunch percentage goes down, that means that we're really having to watch our school nutrition budget and also what that means is for our CEP campuses, and I mentioned this to you previously, is that we have to evaluate that each year because we may have some other campuses that are currently CEP that may have to, may not be able to continue or remain as a CEP campus in future years. But we are continuing to watch that and with the support of Region 12, we'll continue to work on that. So that was the only assumption that changed here. And our revenue did go up slightly here in the school nutrition budget. I am a little bit more conservative in terms of the revenue piece. And Region 12 told us that the Leon Heights, uh, that the impact that they had would be a lot greater than what I have reflected here in this budget. But I'm going prior to the budget adoption, we'll, we will continue to refine these numbers to make sure that we have the most accurate picture to present for you, to you all. Debt service, we did not have any changes in our assumptions, nor did we have any changes in the budget because once again, we're waiting on our certified values. Sorry. And then, of course, we are waiting until next month to adopt the budget and set the tax rate. Any questions? All right. Okay. This is, um, again, a report only, so we're not taking action tonight, but we're getting really close um, to taking action on approval of a budget for our next meeting. All right. No questions? We'll send you certified values information as soon as we get them. Great. Yes, just for everybody's benefit, right? So uh, this is on the tax. Yes. Yeah, I, I'll fill, <laughs> fill in some of this, right? Um, the uh, tax appraisal board did this final certification on Friday. Uh, they spent all weekend loading them into the um, uh, tax assessment uh, systems, right, and preparing those the letters to go out. So we were expecting our letter to come out this afternoon. It was supposed to be emailed before this meeting. We didn't get it. Uh, so we are literally like minutes, hours, a day <laughs> away from having those values. Good. So, good yeah. All right. Nice to have a good connection. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the update. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know the number? Just no. I... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, thank you. Well, we can't say it anyway. No, they know better than the devil. All right. All right. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. All right. 
Up next, Dr. Muller. The Elementary School Playground Accessible Routes Project. All right. Well, let me begin by thanking Tammy Shannon and purchasing and also O'Connell Robertson's. We had a very aggressive timeline on this uh, process to bring this recommendation to you this evening. I'd also like to thank the board for allowing us to bring this to you this evening. Uh, on July 2nd, the district posted for competitive sealed proposals for an elementary school playground accessibility project. The project involves creating sidewalks, ramps, handrails in order to make playgrounds throughout the uh, school district ADA accessible. And originally it was estimated at around $225,000. Proposals were opened and evaluated this morning and the board is, um, the administration is recommending to the board BH Vaccaro Construction who provided a proposal of $198,900. We're also recommending a contingency amount of $10,000. And this project would be paid out of the remaining bond proceeds from the 2012 bond. And there's, based on the last audit, there's roughly $1.3 million in remaining funds. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions for Dr. Mullen? All right, we are taking action on this, I believe. So I'd entertain a motion um, that we accept the recommendation of administration to move forward with the uh, elementary school playground accessible routes project. Jeff, you're going to abstain? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion, Mr. Taggart. Second for Mr. Floor. All in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously with uh, Mr. Norwood abstaining. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schiller, how are you? <laughs> I am good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Employment. Yes, sir. Well, I'd like to point out uh, one individual, Rick Martinez. We have uh, a non-contract uh, person in here um, who's not represented on the, on the packet that you have. But Rick Martinez um, has a, a mechanical engineering degree um, from West Point, And he has a master's degree from UMHB in business administration or management. Um, he has a number of years um, managing departments, um, some facility services, physical plans, and we're excited to have him with Belton ISD and look forward to working with Director him. of Maintenance. Or Director of Maintenance, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> and he's been working, too, and he's doing a great job. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. And a little while ago, um, Dr. King Cannon informed you about Dr. Um, Warren, and so we do have that for an administrative recommendation um, for y'all tonight. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've hired 35 uh, professional employees during the course of this month. Um, 16 resignations were received and accepted, and we have nine remaining positions that we're going to get filled in the next three weeks. Thank you, Mr. Schiller. That didn't sound too bad. No. no? All right. Anyone have any questions? And Mr. Schiller, you're up again. We need to take action on. Oh, we need to take action. action. I apologize. I'm Dr. Moore. Jeez. All right. Entertain a motion. Mr. Floor. Motion, Mr. Floor. Second from Ms. Jordan. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Schiller. Now you're up next. Last month that we brought to you a um, proposed termination of a professional employee. Um, this month we are recommending termination of the professional term contract. Okay. He just needs you to take action. All right. So once again, we're taking action on this. Entertain a motion. Mr. Taggart. Second for Mr. Floor. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Okay. 
Next up is me. Um, <laughs> We're running out of steam. Yeah, we, uh, I would uh, open the floor for any uh, recommendations as we consider appointing our district representative and alternate to the 2018 TASB Delegate Assembly. Uh, any lack of volunteers or um, someone recommended, we'll go to drawing straws or some other. No, thing. we don't have to. Perfect. <laughs> I, rec I recommend Janet Lee for uh, delegate and uh, Jeff Norwood as alternate. Oh, I like that. You two okay with that? Sure. All right. <laughs> well, I think we have to take action on this as well. So. <laughs> All right, Mr. Taggart. <laughs> Motion for Mr. Taggart, second. Mr. Camden, that uh, we elect Ms. Lee as our, our representative for the 2018 Delegate Assembly and Mr. Norwood as our alternate. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you, too. Oh, it's well worth it. You'll enjoy it. Yes, you will enjoy it. Just make sure Janet's available to be there. In Austin. In Austin. Yes. Okay. Up next, any issues, concerns, or future agendas or administrative reports? And since Mr. Norwood's reading something, Mr. Taggart is. Mr. Taggart, you are nothing. Mr. Floor. Uh, I mean, a couple times tonight, some great things about special ed came up. Sort of, they snuck in there and. Uh, I must admit, I'm not real well versed in sort of what's going on. Special ed update? Yeah. Okay, we'll put that on the calendar Excellent for a idea. presentation. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Camden, you good? Yep. Sue? This is not necessarily an issue, but I just I thank you for all of the meeting invites that we get. There are tons of things going on in the district all the time, and so it's nice to have those meeting invites You're so very that we can plan accordingly. Great. You might get more than you want, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep them coming. Hey, at least we'll know. Just we'll at keep least coming with the volleyball one for sure. A volleyball. <laughs> okay. I'll get you. Thanks, Sue. You got it. Ms. Lee? I'm good. Ms. Nord? All right. And future events. I wish I could remember everything. I know, Dr. Cannon, you had mentioned uh, August the 8th as convocation at yes. 8.30. I can do that again. So new teacher orientation luncheon is August the 7th. And uh, that's a, uh, at South Belt Middle School. And we'll make sure you get an invite for that. Then convocation is on the 8th at the Expo Center at 8.30 a.m. And um, of course, the first day of school is August 20th. And that is also a regular meeting for you all. And your first um, attendance boundaries meeting is August the 27th at 6 o'clock p.m. And just out of curiosity, when is the leadership retreat? What are the dates on that? Mm -hmm. The leadership retreat is August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. That's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We'll, we will be in Waco on the 1st and the 2nd out of the district, and we'll be at the Harris Community Center on the 3rd. All right. Thank you. And with that... The board will now go into closed session uh, to discuss security and personnel. And the superintendent's formative evaluation. The superintendent's formative evaluation. Thank you, Dr. Kinkinnon. It being 10 o'clock. <laughs> this may be a record. 10 o'clock. No. Uh, we'll reconvene in open session, and there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned.